is the College of Complexes. And it's another night of finding out the bitter truth about the American news industry. And uh, we're going to hear from our speaker, uh, Andy Anderson, of the Northwest Information Service, who will uh, be telling us uh, about the censored news that we have to uh, rely upon for information in this country. Uh, good evening. Welcome Thank you all for Thanks, coming. Gene, appreciate it. As Brown just said, um, I'm from the Northwest Information Service in Palatine, and my brother and I run the service, and we translate databases as a hobby. Uh, basically, we run it as a public service. I don't make my living at it because uh, talking about certain subjects can get you fired from all kinds of different places. So, since I don't make my living doing this, I can talk about blacked out subjects without worrying about getting fired. Then, uh, the topic, we'll start. Does everyone have a copy of um, the, the three different colored flyers we made for tonight? Uh, one of them is called Conceptual Conservatism. That's on the gray page. And there's a green one uh, that has two different uh, write-ups. Uh, one is the 50th anniversary of JFK and the reality, the, and the other one, this one is on uh, kind of goldish colored paper because we, we picked out three facts that are supported by such a large database of information all over the world that they fit into the category of the old saying, you can take that to the bank. There's no debate on it anymore. What, what I want to talk about tonight is the concept of, number one, how censored news out of Sonoma State University, censored news and Project Censored, describe the process by which the American media maintain Americans in a bubble of mythological ignorance on certain subjects. People in America believe certain things that are out of touch with documented reality from around the world. Just completely out of touch. And the concept that was described in a book on silencing scientists and other scholars, they talk about the, the term the, for the mental condition that allows somebody to go on believing something long after it's been proven false or from a belief that's been completely discredited. You know, the most famous example, of course, one of them out of history is Galileo was prosecuted for saying that the Earth revolves around the Sun. And that, that went contrary to the view of the authorities at the time, so he was arrested. Uh, 800 years ago, you could debate whether the Earth was flat or round. The answer wasn't known yet. Today, people that think the Earth is flat are called people that have a very large dose of flat earth ignorance. <laughs> and I use that term every now and then because on certain subjects, people have a very large dose of flat earth ignorance, and in some cases it doesn't do any harm. In other cases, it's very uh, detrimental to people's health, detrimental to uh, the health of our children. This gray flyer, incidentally, it has space on it. <clears throat> if any of you want to write down a question and get a, uh, a written answer with references, feel free to uh, turn them in at the end of tonight's presentation. It's um, the Conceptual Conservatism Worksheet. So I thought uh, we'd try something different tonight and uh, make this talk uh, slightly interactive with the audience. Um, what I'm talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about facts that are documented and well known all over the world, 
but yet blacked out in the United States. So if we come up on one of those facts that you're not familiar with, or you'd like to know where the references are, just raise your hand any time during the presentation and I'll just, I'll read the titles of a couple of books right into the record here as we're filming. Does everybody understand that pretty much? Okay. In, um, for the new, the new censored news edition, incidentally, the censored news books, the title of tonight's topic is the censored news program that comes out of Sonoma State. It's run by Sonoma State, the student researchers and their professors, and they're linked together uh, with other colleges around the country. This stack of books here on my left, it would be on your right, is uh, a, a stack of the last 20 years worth of censored news handbooks. So for those of you that uh, in the past have said, well, that's an opinion that Andy's expressing, there's no proof. Uh, here's, here's a stack of the books that document what I've been talking about on media censorship over the last 20 years. The, uh, the current book, 214, will run down really quick. Uh, the top 10 stories, uh, you know, the, the, there's 25 basic stories that they give you every year. And I, th I think, I picked the top 10 out of here. All of these would change the political and economic landscape in America if they were covered rather than intentionally blacked out. The first one, of course, is the destruction of the global environment for basic human living conditions. Uh, many, many different researchers and writers consider the overall uh, global warming, climate change, uh, burning fossil fuel and uh, dumping pollutants everywhere is it's changing the physical environment that we have to live on with the planet here. The second topic, number two, is the nuclear disaster in Japan, at Fukushima. Uh, just recently, the last few days, the Japanese government passed a rule that, uh, that says any reporter that tries to write or film, uh, get up close, film, and alert the world of what's happening at that disaster in Japan. Any reporter that tries to write about it can be arrested and tried, you know, for treason against the national security of Japan. So, uh, the, the disaster, the what? Well, otherwise, they're very democratic. Yes, Japan has been very democratic as a common here. Uh, we thought J Japan was a democratic society up until they had the disaster at Fukushima and, uh, there, you can watch interactive maps of time to way uh, how, how the radioactive water is spreading away from the shore of Japan and heading east uh, across the ocean toward the, the western, western border of the United States from Oregon, Portland, you know, all the way down through California. Um, they've been recording higher levels of radioactivity in the air and there's a big huge radioactive cloud of debris in the water uh, that's heading east and a lot of people are uh, looking at not buying any fish that's caught anywhere in the Pacific Ocean now because of the heightened radiation. Um, the disaster in Japan is uh, such that many worldwide radiation experts are already debating on when the rest of the world is going to make the decision if it has to be done to relocate the Japanese people to someplace else. They're not talking about roping off a 10 square, you know, 100 square miles. They're talking about the, you know, the area of Japan itself, including Tokyo, being unfit for human habitation because of the radioactive disaster over there. So any of you uh, that are interested, I would encourage you to log on to the websites of uh, Harvey Wasserman. Harvey Wasserman uh, is a longtime uh, nuclear educator and has published a bunch of articles on this. Number three is the, the new gold rush of fracking. That's hydraulic fracturing. Uh, if, is there anybody here that's not familiar with the, the term fracking? Are you all, everybody in the audience, familiar with uh, the term fracking and how uh, toxic chemicals are being used, pumped into the ground at high pressure? Well. This number three story, the researchers are asking, why is it that none of the media people 
are asking the question, why do highly toxic chemicals have to be used rather than just high pressure water to pump into the ground to fracture the rock and release the natural gas? Well, the answer to that that's emerging is that if you pump toxic chemicals, a, a volatile mix of stuff into the ground, it destroys the groundwater and creates a new gold rush of marketable drinking water and water you need uh, for livestock. Um, everywhere that there's major fracking going on, uh, a lot of the fracking companies are quietly buying up interest in freshwater aquifers in other places in the world. Uh, we mentioned years ago the Bush family, before Bush left office, his family bought 98,000 acres of land in Paraguay. Now what does Bush want with 98,000 acres of land in Paraguay? Well, that spot they bought sits over one of the greatest freshwater aquifers left on the planet that's unpolluted. Though they they recognize, as many other investors do, that the next gold rush is going to be in water because people you know can't survive without uh, drinking water. You know, air, water, uh, and next food. You need those things for basic survival. So there's a gold rush going on of people that are intentionally drawing the groundwater. Number four on this list was the, the complete media failure in America to cover the situation with uh, the man known as, he was Bradley Manning before he changed and his name is Chelsea Manning now. He is the, the, the young uh, person in the military, I, I believe Bradley Manning was in the army. He was a whistleblower and one of the most famous ones. He leaked some video and other documents of the war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. So rather than uh, being rewarded, as the Uniform Code of Military Justice instructs young soldiers, if, if you see a crime against humanity being perpetrated by any troops, our troops especially, or if you're given an illegal order, say to slaughter women and children to clear the area so that an oil company can start drilling there, you're supposed to report those crimes to your superiors. It's right there in the Uniform Code of Military Justice for all the services. Well, uh, the Obama administration is heavily prosecuting these whistleblowers. And that is uh, another one of the top ten on the subject here, that the Obama administration is heavily prosecuting whistleblowers unlike any administration in the history of our country. And they're not, they're not prosecuting anybody that is leaking state secrets or anybody that might be uh, causing harm to America. They're prosecuting people that are reporting the international war crimes of our military and the contractors who are being paid with our tax dollars to slaughter women and children in other places to move them off the land where corporations want the resources. That's what's going on. And the only way you can find out about this is through books like what we've got here, internet sites, these kinds of subjects are not in the mainstream media. They're not in newspapers, they're not in Time, Newsweek, and they're not on radio and television. Number five, of course, um, the number five story uh, in that we have is the rich, well, global predators, billionaire predators who are you know, hiding trillions and trillions of dollars of their wealth in offshore accounts. And the gap, the growing gap between the poor middle class and the super rich, the gap is now the widest it's been uh, since anybody ever did research. You, know, you said you have to go back to the time of the pharaohs before you see a wealth disparity like what we have between the mega billionaires in America and uh, the poor and middle class that are slowly being pushed out. The middle class is being eliminated in America. Now that's one of the top ten most famously blacked out subjects by all the mainstream media is that there, there is a coordinated concerted effort by the people in Congress, uh, especially the ones calling themselves Republicans, some Democrats too, they're passing all kinds of legislation 
to eliminate the middle class as fast as it can be eliminated in America. Now that would have sounded futuristic 20 or 30 years ago. There's a new book out called uh, by George R. Tyler. This book is titled What Went Wrong? And it describes what's happened to the middle class in, since 1973, the year we peaked. 1973 was the peak year for the highest income average relative to everything else. The middle class peaked in 1973, and it's been slightly downhill ever since, but it's been picking up speed after the election of Ronald Reagan. Yeah, George R. Taylor, what went wrong? And um, they describe, Tom Hartman talks about this all the time. He describes we're in our 34th year now, 33rd year of Reaganomics, which is proving to be the biggest failure of an economic governing policy, governing policy in the history of the human race. The idea that if you shovel money to rich people and make them richer than pharaohs, some of it will trickle down to the middle class and the poor. Well, that's a myth, a fantasy that was promoted by the media. Uh, the media is solidly owned in America. There's a hundred. There's a website called They Rule, R-U-L-E, theyrule.com, I think it is, where you can look up 118 uh, wealthy people that sit on the boards, the interlock uh, boards of the Fortune 500. <clears throat> These 118, 120 rich people, you know, control all the major corporations. They control the six major media companies. They control what we see and hear, and their behavior has gotten progressively more and more and more outrageous over the last 30 years. Uh, Ed Schultz, uh, he's a, a broadcaster, a talk show host on uh, Progressive Radio in Chicago and nationwide. He's got an MSNBC show, I think, if it's a five to seven at night. Anyway, uh, Ed Schultz has been saying for the last five years, he can't believe he's seeing things in America happening. Things are happening that he just never thought we'd see in our lifetime. I mean, people are shocked day after day, week after week, by hearing what's, what's being proposed in Congress. I just uh, saw an article the other night. They, uh, they're trying to pass, they want to pass a law, it's a piece of legislation that will uh, identify certain consumers as what they call free riders. That they're trying it out in Arizona. And so the idea is Anybody that puts up solar panels on their house and wants to start collecting some free energy from the sun, they would be deemed a freeloader or a free rider, and they would have to continue paying the utility for the amount of electricity they don't use. So if your electric bill is $50 a month and you put up enough solar panels to get $20 a month in electricity, the utility wants you to continue sending in $50 a month to pay their, for their stranded costs, they say. it's If they built 10 power stations and only five are needed, five are out there as stranded assets. That's what the term is in utility jargon. So the utilities don't want to admit that the stockholders and the CEOs they funded, they built more plants that are needed in the solar age. They want us to just keep paying for those and forget about going solar. And, uh, and there's another article that the oil companies, the Koch brothers, are heavily funding a war in Congress to repeal the tax incentives that have been used to help the wind energy, uh, wind energy business in America. Uh, wind energy gets subsidies that are minuscule compared to the subsidies that are given the, uh, to the oil and gas and nuclear, what Harvey Wasserman called King Kong. Coal, oil, nukes, and gas. Well, King Kong, those industries want to burn as much fossil fuel as they can, as fast as they can, for as long as they can, regardless of what it does to the environment. But, give me a second here.
if we get to number six. We talked about this in, in talks past. Uh, to understand what's happening in America today, it might be helpful if you picked up a copy of this book by Martha Stout. It's called The Sociopath Next Door. It's, and she makes the strong case that one in 25 people, 4% of the population, has sociopathic tendencies. That is, they basically have no ethics, no morals, and no conscience, and they're constantly gaming the system. And she and a bunch of others have made the point, he said that the billionaire predators that want to burn as much oil as they can, they're actually sociopaths. They don't care if we're, we're uh, warming up the planet to the point where the ice caps are going to melt and the sea level is going to rise 20 feet. They want short-term profits now. They don't care that our children and grandchildren, might, the grandchildren especially, might be living on a planet where Manhattan is under 20 feet of water. California coast would be gone. There's already islands out in the Pacific that they're looking toward relocating their people over the next 10 or 15 years because the sea level has been slowly creeping up. And these islands are, you know, very shortly, in a decade or two, going to be underwater just from the, the slow level of the rising of the sea that we're having today. So, uh, the, the climate change, the uh, catastrophic climate change that we're seeing uh, is one of, you know, the, the perennial top ten that are just blacked out by the mainstream media because if people were aware that basically at our present state, going along as we are, our, our grandchild, grandchildren have no future on this planet. They're going to be moving to higher ground and many, you know, there's going to be a big die-off of a lot of mammal mammal life, not just humans, in 40 or 50, 60 years. That's how fast it's happening, and that is not being reported by any mainstream media outlets. It's in the alternative media, all over the place. Another one of the top ten uh, subjects that would change America's perception of what our tax dollars are being used for is the fact that there is now an epidemic of cancer and birth defects in Iraq. More than 50% of all children born in Iraq now have some kind of birth defect and a very uh, growing percentage are uh, born, stillborn, without any chance of life. In 2005, a radiation expert uh, named Lauren Murray, international expert, wrote an article. It was published in Common Dream and a bunch of other places. It's called you know, the Depleted Uranium. Uh, I forget the title of the article. Uh, I have it in our files. Anyway, you could look it up. It was around October of 05, and it basically said Iraq and Afghanistan are uninhabitable long term for humans because of the depleted uranium, little minuscule particles, billions and billions of depleted uranium particles from the exploded uh, tank, bunker busting, uh, armor piercing tank shells that were exploded all over those countries. Those two countries are considered uninhabitable long term now for humans. There, there's still people living there, but as I say, the, the women in Iraq now are experiencing a better than 50% rate of uh, birth defects and deformed children and everything because of the genetic damage. And uh, for those of you that are interested, you can look up a, a VA program. There's a VA study going on. that compares the efforts of our Iraqi war veterans, both Iraq and Afghanistan, but especially Iraq. They're, they're researching, they're quietly doing a research program to see uh, all the healthy children that were born to Iraqi soldiers and their families before they went to Iraq. And now they're cataloging the programs that these soldiers are having coming back from Iraq after doing one or two or three terms over there and trying to make a healthy baby with their wives. Some wives report that they can't even have sex with their husbands because it's, it's a burning sensation. Uh, you know, they're, they're, their husbands are so contaminated with chemicals and radioactive material. I see we have one person in the audience that laughs periodically. Uh, you know, every now and then we'll have people that yeah. have not heard of any of these facts. 
And it sounds so outlandish and outrageous that people just naturally laugh and say, well, that can't be true. I mean, that, if that were true, uh, it would be in the news. We hear that all the time. Uh, you know, people on the 50th anniversary, people say, well, the Kennedy assassination has to be as it was because if it was something different, people would have spoke out by now. Well, people have been speaking out, hundreds of them, uh, eyewitnesses that were there, but that's, that's a little different. We'll get to that in a few minutes when we talk about the three, uh, the largest, three greatest blacked out subjects in American history. But um, another one that would change our perception of what's going on in America is a success story coming out of Iceland. Iceland told their bankers and politicians, we're not going to bail you out. They fired the politicians and prosecuted the criminals, and the politicians, they redid their government, and they arrested and prosecuted a bunch of bankers. And Iceland as a nation voted not to pay off that paper debt that was pumped up as uh, Wall Street fantasy by uh, you know collateralized debt organs, uh, CDOs they're called, collateralized debt obligations. They're basically what Jesus referred to as the money changers way back. Uh, one author uses the term paper terrorism. He says the real terrorism in America is being done by bankers shuffling paper and taking people's property and equity and life savings and everything else. Paper terrorism. And he made the point that uh, you know, 150 years ago, you know, 200 years ago, the, the French came up with a good solution to that kind of terrorism. They invented the guillotine. And they just said these people don't deserve to live uh, because of the, the destruction that they've been causing in society. So other countries have different ways of, of dealing with their criminals. And um, we're moving, we're beginning to move forward. But the problem is the only way people can hear about certain things is like in Galileo's time. There was no television, no, they didn't have any electricity, they had no phones, no internet, very few books. If you, the only way you could learn something was to walk over to somebody's house and sit down and talk to them, have a cup of coffee or tea or something. And that's how knowledge is spreading today on blacked out subjects. So, there's just, there's so much, there, there's so much information out there in the world, so many beneficial things going on that our media doesn't cover. These books, the censored news books, all have a chapter in them called Junk Food News. It describes the 22 minutes of junk and 8 minutes of commercials we get every night on the half hour news stations. They fill the airwaves with junk. I tell people, you know, I'm always constantly telling people, like, if the media didn't keep me informed on Kim Kardashian's boyfriends, I don't know what I would do with myself. I know some of you uh, would like to know who new Tiger Woods' new girlfriend is and what that's all about. Lindsay Lohan going to rehab. Uh, these are junk food news stories about celebrities and don't even get started about the baseball players that claim, I only got a hundred million this year, I need a new contract. <laughs> what is that all about? Well, the Romans, the Romans called it bread and circuses, right? Bread and circuses. You provide entertainment, you make it look like any young boy that has athletic ability can grow up and be a multi-millionaire in the NBA if they practice hard enough. Uh, these are mythologies that are promoted to keep the knowledge away from what's really happening in our country. Uh, we'll take, take a 10 second break here and we'll start with the second segment. There's two stacks of books here. We'll just put them down. If anybody wants to, I should have made the announcement. People can peruse the titles of these. What, what we're working with, the concept, 
I work with the concept of translating evidence that's in a database, a big database. Uh, we take 10, 15, 20 books on a subject and translate that mass into a one-page cliff notes that somebody can read in five minutes because there's no time to read 10 or 15, 20 books a week to stay informed on critical subjects that would change America for the better if the media were covering them. That's the media's job. The media is supposed to do, you know, they assign a reporter and maybe some staff. They would research a subject for, oh, months and then put a report, a uh, five minute report on TV or on 60 Minutes. They have multi-million dollar budgets. They used to do that for investigative reporting in this country. But on critical subjects, not anymore. These, this stack on my left here is a handful of the new books that are summaries of the reality of what happened on the JFK assassination. This country took a turn away from peace justice and fairness toward a permanent war economy that Eisenhower warned about with, when he warned uh, at the end of his term, he said, beware of the military-industrial complex. Yeah, well, uh, Jesse Ventura wrote a book called They Killed Our President, 63 Reasons Why Lee Harvey Oswald Didn't Do It. He said, you only, know, you only need to know one reason. They, they invented the story two weeks ago, we heard a man stand here and just give one bald-faced lie after another that is out of reality. Now, when a person, uh, uh, he might not have thought he was lying to us. He might have actually believed it. That's what, what I talk about in the concept of conceptual conservatism. It's when somebody believes something, they're, they're going along with their worldview, and new information comes up like what happened in you know 800 years ago. Well, the earth is round, it's not flat. Well, the church continued to teach to some people it was flat so that it would keep the population under control. New, a bunch of new evidence on the JFK subject. The reason this is important is that a group of rich people formed a conspiracy and paid off the proper people and they assassinated President Kennedy in 1963, and they set up Lee Harvey Oswald as the patsy. And the reason we know that, for those of you that are curious about how you prove these things, Michael David Morrissey wrote a book called The Transparent Conspiracy. A, tra a transparent conspiracy is when like the Kennedy assassination, they kill somebody in broad daylight, a murder in broad daylight, it's filmed for all to see, and then the clues they leave you show that the official story is impossible if you try to investigate it. And uh, as Jesse pointed out and several others, uh, the people that did the forensic analysis at Parkland when um, Governor Connolly was brought in, Governor Connolly had uh, they took bullet fragments out of his body. He had several different spots where bones were broken or hit, and that was supposed to have been done by the magic bullet that went through JFK and then zigzagged through Connolly's body. Well, firearms experts all over the world have made it very plain and easy to understand. A sixth grader with his first BB gun can understand it. When you fire a bullet out of a gun, the bullet doesn't get bigger and gain lead as it's heading toward the target. If a bullet weighs a quarter of an ounce when you fire it, it weighs a quarter of an ounce when it hits the target. Well, they had one pristine bullet with a little scrap of, uh, scratch on it and a whole bunch of lead fragments that were taken out of Governor Connolly's body that weighed as much as the pristine bullet itself. He said, when you, when you have more bullet fragments taken out of people that were hit than, uh, than a scratch out of one single bullet, that tells you that other bullets were fired. You don't have to look for anything else. You don't even have to look for the forensic evidence that shows that the rifle that they left up in the book depository was a clunky old thing that wasn't accurate and basically uh, weapons experts all over the world have been saying for years that they've never been able to duplicate the supposed precision shots that were fired from behind the driver up 
six stories up behind a tree with leaves on it, and the car was moving forward away from him. And supposedly, only three bullets did all the damage. Well, if you suspend belief in that fairy tale and look at the damage in the car, it shows that eight to ten bullets were fired into Kennedy's limousine from two different shooters. At least two, maybe more. But anyway, uh, these books, uh, there's one called uh, The Updated Crossfire is from Jim Mars. They Killed Our President is Jesse Ventura's. Uh, Lamar Waldron, uh, it's called A Hidden History of the JFK Assassination. That's a brand new, all of these books are brand new, updated with 2013 information. And they've been making the case. They're saying eyewitnesses and people that were there, uh, people that know, uh, the, the doctors that did the autopsy on Kennedy, these people have been speaking out for years. So the idea that, you know, you can't, you can't hide a conspiracy like that is, is just false. It's just, it's incorrect and it's, it has no basis in reality. You can keep people believing in a myth as long as the censored news books describe the process. All, over and over and over again they describe the process. You promote the myth on all channels and you run a simultaneous coordinated blackout on the reality. Like, you know, if you were going to promote flat earth ignorance, you would say the earth is flat, the earth is flat, and then you would run a coordinated blackout on Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends saying the earth isn't flat. We got pictures from the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. On many different subjects, you have, you have a collection of experts. Many of them have been, uh, you know, physicists, chemistry professors are involved in the sciences. They've been studying this stuff for 20 or 30 years. And when two or three or four hundred of them get together and they issue a, a, a report that contradicts an official story, what are you going to do with Albert and his friends? The only thing you can do is run a blackout. If you're going to get try to get people to get uh, believe the earth is flat on any subject, you have to have the ability to control what's in the major media. And that's what we talk about. Uh, on that gold flyer, there's, there's three things, three facts you can take to the bank. Osama didn't do it. Oswald didn't do it. And the third one, of course, is HIV is a harmless retrovirus. It doesn't cause any kind of illness. HIV is not the cause of the diseases that were labeled the AIDS epidemic. Now, if you're over 50 years old, you probably know somebody who died of AIDS or know somebody who knows somebody that died of AIDS. Well, that's a whole other ballgame. I picked these 21 books off my shelf. They form uh, the tip of the iceberg of a very, very large database. I've talked about this before in the past. There's AIDS Incorporated. There's one called You Don't Have to Die Unraveling the AIDS Myth. There's another one called Inventing the AIDS Virus. There's another one called AIDS Opium Diamonds and Empire that gives you the whole entire history. That book was published in 2010. This one is Dr. Nancy Turner Banks. Uh, she published this book, AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire, in 2010. And it's a history of the last 150 years of drug running by American corporations to prop up their stock prices, among other things. The drug trade isn't just a few crackheads that want to fix. The drug trade is officially brought in, uh, you know, uh, brought into America by very well-connected, high-ranking people and corporations and the CIA. Our own CIA was running drugs to give money, uh, buy weapons for the Contras. It was called the Iran-Contra scandal back in the 80s. But um, she, she gives the best summary. This, her book is an up-to-date summary of this stack here that state goes back 25 years saying, in a nutshell, what you need to know about the AIDS epidemic is HIV 
is one of 50 harmless retroviruses. And the scientists knew that when they paid Robert Gallo to stand out in front of a microphone like this and announce it at a press conference in 1984. That's how the idea got started that we had this fatal virus that was causing all these different kind of immune system illnesses. And then they developed a test, they, very rapidly they developed a test, they called it an HIV test, but it doesn't test for HIV. It reacts to particles in your blood that are caused by the immune system when it's under stress from almost any kind of illness. Uh, the doctors in Africa have been reporting for years that they've been, they don't even use HIV or AIDS tests in Africa. If somebody has uh, conditions uh, related to malnutrition, bacterial infections from uh, polluted water, if they've lost, uh, they got a persistent cough and they've lost uh, 10 pounds in the last month or something, they just tell them they have AIDS. Now Africa has become the market for the expensive AIDS drugs that killed 300,000 people in America. There's a, for those of you that are interested in the history of this, all those people that we were told were dying of AIDS, the overwhelming majority of them, probably 95% that died, were being poisoned by the AIDS doctors. There's a book in here called uh, AIDS and the Doctors of Death. There's another one that was published in 2007 called The uh, Wrongful Death, The AIDS Trial. And it, it's a story of when some law firm puts it all together and files a class action lawsuit for the intentional poisoning of 300,000 young Americans, mostly gay people, but a lot of minorities too, they find out that the medicine that they were giving people is described in this book. It says, Poison by Prescription, the AZT story. John Lorison published this book, wrote it in 1990. They, the scientists that approved AZT for treatment, they quoted the, the, the people from Burroughs Welcome who were given the, the ability to develop and sell that drug in America. They took a fatal old chemotherapy drug sitting around with no patent. It was unfit for human use. They paid the doctors on the FDA panel, the ones that uh, have to approve a new drug for trial and usage. The doctors that didn't resign they were made multi-millionaires. One doctor that did resign said, I'm not going to be part of this. That's going to be like taking rat poison four times a day. And in, in uh, Dr. Banks' book, she refers to that one. They actually tried that compound uh, as a possible uh, chemical that could be used for rat poison because it just stopped the growing cells all over the body. Well, Burroughs Welcome in 1987, when they put that out in market, they said it's right there in the files. One of the all-time favorite quotes that ranks up there are well, famous quotes with the tobacco industry, you know, make it for a penny, sell it for a dollar. Well, the, the internal documents at Burroughs Welcome said, we're going to kill two birds with one stone with this first drug we're going to put on the market and give to everybody that's told they have AIDS or high-risk people. If they take it according to doctor's orders, we we got a twofer. We're going to make billions and billions because people will stretch out their life. We'll take sick people, we'll tell them you have AIDS, we'll give them this compound, and we'll, we'll make billions, and this is going to be 100% fatal. There will be no survivors. Taken according to doctor's orders, there will be no survivors because the chemical stops the growing cells all over the body. It doesn't, for every one cell that might have had some harmless HIV in it, it kills a thousand other cells in the body. And so, all those people wasting away on AIDS, losing 10 pounds here, night cramps, liver damage, cancer, those are the published side effects of that chemical AZT that was sitting around on the chemist's shelves at the NIH with no patent since the 1960s. So, we, this country has allowed hundreds of billions of dollars to be transferred from poor and middle class people into the bank accounts of the drug companies that have been producing these drugs for the so-called AIDS epidemic. And the AIDS epidemic is not, is not the only time they're overcharging. Or you know, It's welfare for billionaires is what it is. Uh, there's a book called The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy by uh, Jim Mars. It has a chart in there on one of the pages. It has the top 20 drugs that are sold in America like Prozac and Xanax and uh, 
you know, the uh, Celebrex, the, the, the main ones they advertise. They, he just picked 20 at random. Said, here's one that they make the chemicals for that. It costs them 11 cents to make a bottle. They sell it for $300. Here's another one. It costs them $1.21 to make the chemicals. They sell it for $500 a bunch. You know, the, our, our country, one of the, again, you'll find it in these, the censored news stories over the last two decades, our country stands alone. We're number one in the world among industrialized countries. We're the only country that allows this kind of profiteering, a profit-driven medical industrial complex. It's a wealth transfer system. You know, uh, in, in the last 50 years, it's, it's gotten way out of hand. When I was growing up, you, if you, had, uh, you fell on your bike and you, you had to get stitches or something, the emergency room bill wasn't $22,000. I mean, that's just wealth transfer. That's all it is. We're, we're running the greatest welfare for the rich program that the world has ever seen. And that's where we are. Uh, so, that stack of books, incidentally, is about a third. These 21 books, they, they form a collective summary of a huge database of uh, scientists, researchers. Uh, in other countries, uh, in other countries they've been reporting, they've been working with the World Health Organization report. For those of you in the audience that might be skeptics, go look up a report that was put out by the World Health Organization in June of 2008. In June of 08 they said the heterosexual AIDS epidemic is over. In fact, there won't be any and there hasn't been any. It's over. We're sorry, they made a mistake. And the only place they're still reporting that people uh, can catch AIDS is in Africa because they're running a population reduction program with the toxic fatal chemicals in Africa that have been phased out of America and banned in Europe and Australia and a whole bunch of other places. The knowledge, the knowledge is rapidly spreading around the world that the AIDS epidemic is what one documentary called it uh, the crime of the century. Another do documentary, uh, it's called Positively False, that came out of England by uh, Joan Shenton, and uh, they, uh, they run a, um, it's like, a, like our 60 Minutes investigative uh, thing on, on, on Sunday. Well, there, theirs is called Meditel on Channel 4, and they, they investigate different kinds of uh, medical scandals and uh, try to alert the people. As I said, uh, none of this information that I've given you on AIDS is in anywhere new at all. It's, it's been solid for 20 years in other countries, but still seamlessly blacked out in America. It's one of, one of I think, one of the three or four most radioactive subjects in America. If a reporter goes anywhere near this, tries to talk about it, they just hit the red button, cut off the picture, go to commercial, and that reporter gets fired and blackballed. You can look up, um, Christina Borgeson was a journalist that wrote a book in 2004. It's been about a decade. The title of her book is called Into the Buzzsaw. And she collected the stories of 18 Pulitzer Prize winners that tried to report you know, one, a story one day, and they got fired blackballed. And that's how they got the title. The career, career went into the buzzsaw because these reporters didn't know they were working on something that was basically radioactive in the, uh, as far as being taboo. Every major city has its own short list of sacred cows of things that are relatively taboo and you would uh, cut into the profits of some big corporation if you were to report it. Up until uh, I think about three years ago, I may have mentioned this in the past at several of my talks, up until three years ago, a reporter could get fired or blackballed in Chicago for writing about the houses in the suburbs that have no furnace that heat for ten dollars a month. That's uh, because within a hundred mile radius around ComEd and the gas company, that's a taboo subject to talk about. That uh, they've been building houses in Aurora, Schaumburg, all the way to the Wisconsin border. <coughs> houses have been built in the western suburbs that uh, have no furnace and a tiny heating system because they have windows and walls that don't lose heat. 
Now the new standards are being implemented in other states. Wisconsin and Minnesota, I think, are two of the states that mandate having a fresh air exchanger because the house is airtight. You live if you live in a thermos bottle, it's well insulated. You don't need to buy a lot of energy from the utility. You can have a heating bill that's easily ten dollars a month for an ordinary two thousand square foot house. And uh, but this is. We could do a whole evening. We could do a whole evening, uh, two hours on any one of these subjects that are completely blacked out by the mainstream press. Now, uh, you know, Commonwealth Edison has figured out that they can make money just selling electricity over the transmission lines. They're, they've sold all their nuclear power plants to somebody else. It might be Exelon or something, but ComEd wants to be uh, own the toll road, in other words, of uh, the main electric lines. That, that That's their goal. And they, ComEd put out a report in uh, this year, in January, uh, ComEd put out a report saying that 17% of Americans have access to cheaper electricity right now. And by 2015, as the price of solar is dropping, it doesn't even have to be subsidized, and it's going to be competitive with utilities in many parts of the country. So ComEd said that they don't want to be in the position of Kodak Film. Kodak Film wasn't paying attention to the world going digital, digital, and they had to file bankruptcy a few years back because times are changing. You know, the people that make 8-track tapes don't sell 8-track tapes anymore. If they didn't go out of business, they switched over to cassettes and then... DVDs, CDs, and then you have iPods. The world is moving forward. Technology moves forward, and companies that keep up with it are ones that uh, you know stay alive. So, what? What question? No. I put out a digital camera. I bought one. Did somebody ask a question? Uh, you want a camera, you say? So Kodak. Kodak digital. brought out a digital camera. Oh, they're well, they're 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 going digital. Yeah, what well, they had to file. Yeah, you know, as I understand it, they filed re re. You know, uh, what do you call it? Bankruptcy reorganization. Right. If, if, if you restructuring. A lot of companies are restructuring. The last thing we'll talk about briefly before we open it up to questions. I hope you guys have been taking notes and writing questions down because we uh, we have out of the databases that I've summarized tonight, you know, there's there's a huge amount of data, not just one guy that wrote a book. It's not not one opinion from somebody. It's a database, and at some point, it gets so big that you can't ignore it anymore. It, it's like like what happened with the asbestos industry. You know, the, the, the data was growing and growing. They knew asbestos was a health hazard in 1918. By 1929, they had developed a strategy for sealing lawyers' files and paying claims and settling out of court if, if the lawyer would agree to not ever participate in another asbestos lawsuit. That's how they covered it up for almost 50 years until the evidence became so overwhelming in 1982, the basic industry, you know, shut down and filed bankruptcy. And now we have asbestos claims going on with the removal of buildings. But, you know, knowledge moves forward in the direction of the truth. It doesn't go backwards. And uh, other countries are showing what it means to move in a positive direction. Iceland has arrested their bankers. They're making one of the fastest economic recoveries of any country on Earth. <coughs> Iceland. Germany already put up enough solar panels to shut down 20 nuclear power plants. There's windmills and solar panels in Sweden, Switzerland. Um, Japan, incidentally, just put up a two megawatt big wind machine off the coast of Fukushima. That's where they're getting their electricity from a big, huge windmill built by Hitachi. And it's sitting out there on a floating platform like like an oil derrick, right out there off the coast. And you know, coastal wind is wind machines. They have options all over the world. But it means that we have to do something to face the reality of the people that are what they're doing, the people that are running America, the rich billionaires that own and operate and control 
our elected, supposedly elected officials, have been moving America in a direction toward massive fossil fuel use, terrorism all over the world. They're saying they're fighting for terrorism, but that's not the case. They're mapping out, the only place American troops are hunting for so-called terrorists around the world is over uh, oil-rich and resource-rich areas. The, uh, the, the map of the bases built in Afghanistan matches the map of the new pipeline, the pipeline route that's being built across Afghanistan. So uh, if you haven't heard this before, I suggest you look it up because it's not my opinion. You know, uh, the, my name, Andy Anderson, is not on any of these books here. Many of these people have Nobel Prize credentials. A few of them have Nobel Prizes. Many of them have Pulitzer Prizes for investigative journalism. And as, as a group, they form an unimpeachable database of reality. And the, now, many of these authors, this stack of books here is a uh, short that's probably a tenth of what's available right now on the forensic evidence. There, uh, many, many books have been published all over the world on the forensic evidence of what happened on the morning of 9-11. In America, we have people that are still going along with the official fairy tale so that they don't have to think about what it means for us as adults that we have to do something to change the direction America is going in. It's up to us, all of us. Um, <coughs> Professor Griffin has got 10 books out. This book here is a physics textbook written by a Professor Judy Wood. The title is Where Do the Towers Go? And she's, she makes the simple case. She makes the simple case that the two towers did not collapse and fall to the ground from the plane crashes. The plane crashes had nothing to do with the two towers coming down because they were spread sideways in the wind as a cloud of fine powdery dust. The firemen, the firefighters that survived came out after each building collapsed. They're looking around and says, where's the building? Where's the rubble? Well, it's going sideways in the wind as hundreds of thousands of tons of fine powder that was converted in seconds. The two twin towers were converted to dust clouds in seconds. The third tower that came down, a lot of people don't know there were three towers that came down in New York. The third tower was building seven that came down at 520 in the afternoon. And that building, that is the smoking gun of the whole 9-11 episode because the collapse of building seven was reported by reporters uh, they, they said it was evacuated, the building has just collapsed, there's no loss of life. They're reading the copy in live television 25 minutes before the explosives were triggered. Jane Stanley from the BBC is standing out there with a microphone like this one, reading that uh, Building 7 has collapsed, we think that there was no loss of life because the firefighters evacuated. That's a piece of film that the BBC claimed they lost until several uh, viral internet sources uh, said, well, we can loan you our copy until you locate your original. Because they, they pulled her microphone feed a couple minutes before the explosives were triggered. But for 20 minutes, this woman is reporting the collapse of the third tower, and the building is standing off her left shoulder there behind her in the New York skyline. CNN also reported it early. So the media had the script on 9-11. 9-11 was a totally scripted event where they laid down all the pieces of the m mythology, the story of Osama bin Laden. Uh, you know, by, by noon, they had the official story after the buildings collapsed. It was out there on all channels, and by 9 o'clock at night, there were, I, I'm not, I forget who, whether it was Dan Rather, not Dan Rather, I thought maybe Peter Jennings or Tom Brokaw and some other, there were New York reporters out there reporting at 5 o'clock that Building 7 looked like the controlled demolition of an old hotel. They were using that, that actual terminology. They said, didn't that look like how the, the old hotels are in Las Vegas or brought down in a controlled demolition? Well, by 9 o'clock at night, the words controlled demolition and Building 7 were just erased from the airwaves in America. So if you weren't watching TV at that point to see it, 
Next day, you didn't hear it. Well, and uh, finally, this September, a billboard campaign was run nationwide, starting in New York. They, they, they put up billboards saying, rethink 9-11, with a question mark, said, did you know that three towers came down in New York? Three towers were demolished. We were told there were only two plane crashes. So a seventh grader can do the math. So as citizens, we have the same responsibility for what our tax dollars are being used for as active duty policemen have a responsibility to investigate something. If you run up to a policeman and say, I think there's a, uh, a woman's being assaulted over here in the next door, can you do something about it? If that policeman says, um, I don't think there's assault going on because I'm, I'm having lunch. As soon as I get through with lunch, then I'll, I'll go investigate maybe. What would we think of a person whose job it is a normal cop. to investigate? Thank you. Now, if, if a policeman's having lunch and they have no knowledge of a crime three blocks over, they can't be held responsible. But if you give them information and then they say, well, I don't think that's happening, that's called obstruction of justice, and you can be prosecuted for it. Um, Not if you're a cop. <coughs> Eric Larson wrote the book. Uh, this is a book called The Skull of Yorick. And in that book, he talks about Amy Goodman, Noam Chomsky, and all the supposed left-wing uh, democracy now types, you know, the progressive media. He said, it's their job to investigate. And they're all pretending like there's no evidence on 9-11. Nothing to see here. They're, he refers to them as uh, being in the same category as that Norwegian fellow called um, Norwegian. Vidkun Quisling was his name. And that's where the term Quisling comes from, consorting with the enemy, doing something where, you know, uh, it, it's willful ignorance. I say there, there's, four, there's four stages of ignorance. You're blissfully ignorant, then you're intentionally ignorant when somebody brings you evidence, say, well, I don't want to look at that. And then after a while, the evidence becomes so overwhelming around you that you become offensively ignorant. And then the fourth stage is obstruction of justice. You're helping somebody cover up a crime. Solving, solving, facing the reality of what happened on 9-11 and busting the myth and moving forward would free up a trillion dollars a year that our military is supposedly using to hunt for terrorists around the world. When that's one of the perennial top ten subjects that are not since the Vietnam War have our young soldiers, men and women both, been defending freedom and justice anywhere in the world. They've been doing what General Smedley Butler talked about in 1935. He said, I was muscle for the mob, the United Fruit Company. Our job was to keep, keep the third world safe for American businesses that just wanted to you know, gather resources wherever they were, you know, regardless of whether the people living in that country objected to it. What did and you say was the name of that book? The name of this book uh, is called The Skull of Yorick. And there's a bunch of essays written. He wrote a book in 2006 called A Nation Gone Blind, 2006. His, 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 he's a retired college English professor. And he said, how is it possible that Americans are maintaining themselves in a state of willful blindness, willful we ignorance, when their tax dollars are being used to murder people denial. in other countries? It's denial. It's, denial. it's massive denial. This is where we are. So, facing the mechanisms that cause this kind of denial and moving forward with documented reality, we, can, we got 5% of the world's people. We can do what people in other countries are doing, like Iceland, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland. I don't know if any of you know that the, the little German smart car, that little car made by Mercedes, little short stubby thing, the model they give us in America gets about 45 miles to the gallon. But the same car with a slightly different engine and carburetor, same car, gets 73 miles of the gallon on the streets of Europe. High mileage cars are being kept off the streets of America. Some, some high mileage cars are made here by American companies and they're exported. Uh, a friend of mine that works for ComEd, he bought an electric car. A friend of his said, oh yeah, 
he heard, I forget which model it was, I gotta track it down. The Ford, Ford makes one that gets like There's 70 miles of the gallon here. for the European model. But the American model is only 38 miles of the gallon. So they, they, Rocky Mountain Institute published a book in 1980 called Brittle Power. <coughs> and they, they talked about all the different energy sources and everything. And, and in that book they mentioned that in 1980, 1980, mind you, 33 years ago, Volkswagen was testing a 98 mile per gallon diesel Rabbit. They've been testing 100 mile per gallon prototypes for over 30 years. They know how to build them, and they would be affordable. But they would cut into the gross profits of the so oil companies. Mama and SUV what Buckminster Fuller? Did you have a question? I said, until some soccer mom in an SUV runs over your ass. Uh, what's that for? They're, they're quite, uh, here, let me address that right now. We're talking about high mileage, high mileage, safe, affordable vehicles. Um, vehicles can be made much more efficient and aerodynamic. And, uh, and smaller and lighter. Did, uh, the, the gentleman said uh, the only way you can get high mileage is in a tiny vehicle that's unsafe. He is apparently unaware that Rocky Mountain Institute worked with a company to design an, uh, an SUV the size of a Lexus. Are you familiar with the Lexus RX 300? It's an SUV. Uh, are you familiar with that? Yes or no? I've been sending Amory Lovins checks for decades. Okay. Well, then you, you know that they talked about... Uh, the possibility of producing uh, an SUV the size of a Lexus that gets 99 miles of the gallon also. So uh, high mileage designs are not taboo. They're being held off the market by the predatory capitalists that own and operate our politicians. That's it. And uh, if we find some way to do what the people in other countries are doing, there's no reason why we couldn't have safe, high mileage cars here. But it's up to us, all of us. Then why is it that my Prius gets 50 miles to the gallon? Uh, the question is, why does the Prius get only 50? Well, that's a good question, because the early designs we were reading about were going to be 75 and 80 miles to the gallon. I was shocked to hear that the first Priuses that came out, the hybrids, only got 50 miles to the gallon on the highway. They should be able to do better. But again, we could uh, have a, a whole uh, discussion for a night. We could show, show the video called Who Killed the Electric Car? That's a good one. Uh, but the whole, you know, the whole issue of high mileage transportation is linked together with a bunch of other things also about you know, how many miles people travel. Are, are, people don't live near where they work like they do in other countries. We have the, you know, the, the interstate highway system. You know, there's uh, a lot of inertia built up with people doing one thing or adhe adhering to a certain view over the years. So it's, it's Jeremy Rifkin wrote a book uh, published a couple of years ago and he said when he wrote about global warming in 1980, he was wrong. He said he grossly underestimated how fast it was happening. And all of the climate scientists that are publishing articles almost weekly all over the place, they're saying basically the same thing, that each year we get better and better uh, computer numbers, better analysis uh, measurements from around the poles and everywhere else. Global warming and climate change is happening faster than anybody thought we would be seeing it. So, you got a question back there? I uh, just want to make a statement. In 1939, Tesla had made a car that ran off of electricity that came from the air. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's uh, there's a lot of... There, uh, Tesla was... Um, we'll get into the question. I think we'll just start the question and answer period here shortly. Um, there's been a lot of uh, inventions over the years that could have moved us toward energy efficiency. But the patents on those things were bought up by the major oil companies and, and the major energy companies. And then there have been, you know, it's in the folklore, the legend. Somebody developed something. If it's uh, 
Stephen Greer runs a site called um, Disclosure, the Disclosure Project, and uh, his site can be found as part of, there's a website called Want to Know Info. I have some cards here if anybody wants one. These are the portal websites that I use. You know, Common, Dream, Common Dreams, Truth Out are two of the ones that post news without the junk. Uh, many of the authors here uh, that have wrote books about you know the nuclear movement in the 1980s, Harvey Wasserman, Robert Shear, uh, a bunch of those authors published first on a, a site called The Smirking Chimp, for anybody that's interested. And uh, I found some highly, highly credible articles. And you know they basically summarize their life's work on a three or four page printable article. Now before the before we had Google, uh, before you could search the internet like what we can do today, you, you it took a lot longer to find knowledge. You had to check a book out and read it yourself from the library. Today you can get summaries published by these people. They're in their 60s and 70s. They've been doing this their whole life. There's a whole wealth of information on uh, of a handful of really good sites. So, um, anybody wants a card, uh, come see me afterwards. I think uh, we'll just start this qu questions and answer period now. I can answer. You can, you can sit, Barb. It's okay. I can just uh, point out. There's not many hands here. Well, there. You want to stand up? Yes, I do. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah, I know. We, we can manage it. <laughs> Let's right. thank our speaker. All right. the first question. Uh, you know, the people who own and run this country are schools. If loud, they, loud, please. Uh, the people who own and run this country are schools. By eliminating the middle class, as you suggested, aren't they creating a revolutionary situation that will lead to their overthrow? Uh, the, the question was, he said, you know, the question is, if the people that own and operate our politicians, the billionaires that are running the country, they're not fools. Why would they eliminate the middle class or push push things to the point where there might be an overthrow? I held up that other book earlier uh, called The Sociopath Next Door. Here's another one called Without Conscience, The Disturbing World of Psychopaths Among Us, Robert D. Hare. Ph.D. H.A.R.E. is his last name. Robert D. Hare, H.A.R.E. And these books talk about, I've talked about it before, how a billionaire can stand in front of the mirror and say, I have two kids to put through college and a wife that needs to shop, and I only got $22 billion in the bank. I need another 40 or $50 billion at least before I can pay my people a living wage. That's a psychopathic, sociopathic tendency. And when, when you see that, you don't deal with these people logically. You have to find some way to control them. We've been, I've been saying for six years now, uh, repeating what hundreds of authors have said, if you allow predators to rise to the top and become <coughs> excuse me, billionaires, if you do not regulate, regulate predators, <clears throat> they will they will get big enough and like mindless sharks they'll eat everything in sight the, the John McMurtry the Canadian professor wrote a book in 1999 it was published called the cancer stage of capitalism he said unregulated capitalism will start out small like a, a single cancer cell it'll get bigger it'll grow exponentially it'll finally get bigger bigger and bigger it'll become a fatal tumor that'll kill the host. And we, as Americans, we're living in the final stages of that right now. If we don't do something, these billionaire predators are, are going to totally destroy the middle class, they're totally destroying the environment, and they don't care. Because, you know, they're, they're going to be passing away in five, ten years. What do they care what the planet looks like 30, 40 years from now? Does that answer your question? Partly, you know, yeah, you say they're not stupid. No. Yes, they are. We, uh, I'll, I'll say this. People say 
the Bush administration had a lot of stupid people in it for eight years, from 2000 to 2008. I see they had some of the smartest, most, it was the best oil, smoothest running criminal machine in the history of this country. We had eight years of the greatest wealth transfer from all kinds of criminal means into the bank accounts of billionaires. No place on the earth has ever seen anything like it. Those people weren't stupid at all. They knew what they were doing. And, they, and that, that's the deal. With, that's why you always hear this when they catch a serial killer, like somebody like John Wayne, Wayne Gacy or uh, Ted Bundy, son of Sam. You know, the neighbors say, oh, he was such a nice boy. Uh, he only helped me get the groceries. And he was such a nice boy. I can't believe you're saying these things about him. People just, you know, the evidence, if people refuse to look at it, Sociopaths are not stupid. They're they're very smart, and they can blend in. And it you know, it, it, it takes a while to learn uh, how to deal with them. And I, I highly recommend getting a copy of either of these books, especially the one called The Sociopath Next Door. That's available. You know, uh, he's got he's holding it up right over there. Uh, Hold right. it up. The Sociopath Next Door. You want to understand what our leaders are doing and uh, how they are being bought and sold by billionaire predators, get that book, among others. Okay? Uh, who, who has the next question? Uh, yes, Neil. Okay. Uh, three very short questions. Round number estimate, how many books do you have debunking the Oswald long, uh, Lone Gunman model? Uh, I probably have ten. Uh, but the, I, I haven't uh, been following it okay. that long because the, okay. the four new ones. I have the four new ones with the newest okay. release. Roughly, roughly, how many books do you have debunking the the model that the twin towers went down from the two jets? Probably thirty-five or forty. Okay. And my third question: How many books do you have debunking those other books? Uh, I've I've gotten a couple. But usually uh, the debunkers, uh, when they try to debunk reality, they, you have to resort. You have to resort to uh, just making up stuff, you know, uh, false statements. Because there, there's, as I said, there's no way to debunk Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends if they're saying the Earth is flat. Once you know, knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. If it's, you know, the truth is what it is. Reality is reality, and yet it can't be massaged around. You can lie about it, or you can, you can just say, well, that's not true, which is what the debunkers do. But the actual science, the, uh -huh. on all of these things I'm talking about, the science is easy to understand. Yeah, but you can debunk anything if you believe the Earth is 6,000 years old and there's no such thing as science then there, there, there's, there's no way to have a conversation with a person with that kind of mindset. Right. Tim? Okay. You know, Andy, I tend to not believe a lot of what you say because I'm more of the traditionalist person. In a brief statement as possible, can you tell me who killed Kennedy and what happened on 9-11? Just very briefly. In 25 words or less, uh, the question was, who killed Kennedy and what happened on 9-11? Well, Kennedy was assassinated by uh, a conspiracy of people from the Mafia, the CIA, and uh, maybe something else. But they, they, had, uh, they were uh, you know, rich predators that had the ability to have the Secret Service stand down at a critical part. Of, of the time. The Secret Service stood down like the anomalies on 9-11. But these new books describe how the Mafia, uh, a guy named Carlos Marcello, imported a pair of hitmen from Italy to, uh, to fire, to be the crossfire that fired the rifles, and Oswald, Oswald was set up as the patsy. The other thing on 9-11, all you need to know is the two twin towers were converted to dust in seconds and spread over Lower Manhattan as a cloud of dust. The uh, they were they were packed with some kind of explosive, some kind of huge energy was uh, released in the buildings. We don't know where what floors the explosive were on. All you need to know is, as one fireman said, when a building turns to dust in the air and it's steel and concrete and is dustified, and then it drifts away in the wind. 
When a building is supposed to collapse and it doesn't collapse, it goes sideways in the wind, you know that something bad happened in the air. Building 7 was a conditional controlled demolition. But there's, there's no debate among physicists, chemistry professors, everybody is familiar with the fact that the two twin towers did not collapse. They formed a big cloud of dust in seconds. The, the buildings were being dustified before anything hit the ground. The waves of explosives went down faster than the speed of gravity so that they were exploded and pulverized from the top down. So that's why in a few seconds the big cloud of dust formed. The cloud was going up and out. Judy Wood's book, it's, a, it's a, like a physics textbook, it's called Where Did the Towers Go? 9-11 um, was, you know, all of, the, all of these books talk about the reason 9-11 was created was to be our new Pearl Harbor to get the Patriot Act passed. The Patriot Act to change our laws and so that no American that's not a billionaire has any rights. Any one of us could be arrested and disappeared without a phone call. That's in the Patriot Act and that was prepared before 9-11 happened. They dumped it on the Congress shortly afterwards and the two senators that wanted to read it before they passed it, they got anthrax letters in the mail right after that. So the whole, 9-11 was a well orchestrated attempt to speed up the coup that took place in 1963 when Kennedy was assassinated. They want to move the country in a different direction away from the wishes of the American people. The American people want a clean, green, non-military future where our sons and daughters aren't coming back committing suicide because they're being ordered to murder women and children all over the world in resource risk places. That's what's going on. That's the reality. There's no debate on it anymore. And as I said on this gray flyer, it's okay to be unaware of some facts. Knowledge spreads at a certain speed. But if you continue a person that you know, attend one of these talks or somebody else's, if you continue to believe that the reality isn't the reality, that the official fairy tale is true, then it slows down the efforts of all the rest of the people to do what they did in Iceland. Arrest these bastards. Throw some people in jail. You know, no, nobody has been arrested for in, incompetence. We were told that 9-11 was incompetent. All of those people that managed the key positions in 9-11, air traffic control, they all got promotions. Nobody was reprimanded. So I, I would highly recommend, uh, you, know, you see me afterwards if you want to uh, get a couple of, uh, you know, titles that are summaries of a huge database. Right. The summaries are getting better and better. Uh, who else had? Any majority no, you just asked, you just, that, believe that, you just uh, had me ask a question. It's the next person's turn. Okay. Uh, all right, Ileana. Speech. What's your question? My, um, actually, small comment. No, to your comment. Well, in that well, case, a hold it. All right, uh, Gene. Uh, 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 I need a little clarification here. When you mention that they show you the incident, for instance, like the president getting shot in Dallas, mm -hmm. that was uh, uh, in real time in a real, supposedly, uh, a recording, and you said that. They record this. However, the clues doesn't match what you see. Now, you, uh, it's uh, some. Uh, it's, uh, to me, it's like incomplete. How can you? Uh, would you comment on why the clues doesn't uh, fit the thing? Uh, the Gene, uh, yeah, Gene's asking the question of uh, well, when when like something happened in Dallas, and then the clues they give you don't match the crime. Um, it's what it, it's what this author calls a transparent conspiracy. See, the billionaires that wanted to get rid of Kennedy, if they didn't want the public to know, they, they could have just poisoned his coffee at night or something, right? He could have had a heart attack. And the people wouldn't know that some very powerful people got rid of the president, and that was the message that went out. When uh, Senator Paul Wellstone's plane went down 10 days before the election, and that message, they, they see the messages to other congressmen and anybody that would stand up to these people, look, we killed the president. There's a, a comedian, Bill Hicks, you, you can look, um, I'll, I'll finish this, 
he said when a new president gets elected, they take him into a video, uh, they pull the screen down, and they show him a short video of the Kennedy assassination where the camera angle is from the right front of the car, the grassy knoll. They show him a picture of how it was done, and then the screen goes up and they say, any questions, Mr. President? They want them to know that it's done in broad daylight, and then the official story is such a crock that anybody that investigates says, wow, these powerful people have the ability to put this fairy tale out on the airwaves. They are in control. That's, this is why reporters don't investigate some of these things, because they're afraid of getting killed. A lot of people were killed uh, earlier in the Kennedy uh, eyewitnesses and anybody that tried to investigate. Well, you made it, you Does made that answer your question, or you still have part of it? No, no, you made it uh, complicated. I didn't want you to go there. That's the, the point is that we, we saw what happened on television, right? Right. And you said that it, uh, uh, the, the, the implication was that those was real, uh, not that they can't mess with film either, but those was real in real time in Dallas on that day at that time, and what we saw was a, a, a reality. Mm -hmm. Okay. You mentioned the clues didn't fit what you see on television. All I want to know, and I ain't got no agenda, no way out, sophisticated. Who, what you mean about the, the, the clues doesn't match what I saw? Or what the I'm not talking about the official story doesn't match. The, if we, we saw, you know, the, the eyewitnesses that were there saw two shooters, two riflemen, fire bullets into the car. The eyewitnesses saw that, yeah, but wait, that's not the official story. Now, well, hold it now. You, you, uh, and this is the end of me uh, asking in, uh, uh, about this. But you, and I've made a little note here, you use the word clues, not official story. You use oh, the word okay. clues. Oh, okay. I, 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 I meant the official story, oh, the clues. Oh, then that's not the, 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 the rifle up there on the sixth floor, that was a clue they left us. Oh, okay. that, yeah, that wasn't the eyewitness testimony out here near the limousine. It was you know, the, all the official, uh, the so-called clues in their investigation when oh, okay. they investigated where Oswald was supposed to be and all that. Okay. There, everything didn't match what the eyewitnesses saw. Okay. Charlie. Charles? Yeah, now you saying in 9-11, an order was given to all the print radio, broadcast media of the United States and the world that the term controlled demolition was not to be used. No, How did this order, who gave this order, and how did they disseminate it? What agency of the government and by what authority did they do this? Did they use how did they, you said that the word was not used anymore. Yeah. How did they get, how did they give their orders? What is the, there are thousands of stories every day. Guys are writing stories. Who reviews these? Charlie says, he's asking the question, uh, why wasn't the term controlled demolition well, who used? Who gave the order? order? I opened my talk tonight with pointing to a stack of these books, Censored News. These books describe how and why billionaires that own the media control what we see and hear on the airwaves. There, there was no order given during the day of 9-11. Reporters were out there. People were reporting. They were reporting what it was supposed to be a big surprise to everybody. So for a lot of the reporters that weren't in on the, you know, the deal, uh, most of the reporters, they were reporting what they saw. Now, one uh, CNN interviewed one guy with a baseball cap, and he said, oh, well, yeah, I saw the two planes go into the towers, and the flame was so hot, steel melted, and poof, the building just fell down. Well, that guy was an unemployed actor. CNN knew right where he was, and he was part of the media, uh, the mythology that was laid down that day. CNN Unemployed actors, they hired... They had plants. People. They had plants out there to be interviewed, to give, look like man-on-the-street eyewitness accounts. ABC did, NBC. Different ones. Uh, you know, the whole, they went to the theater guild. No, no, they, that's not how you do it. Uh, but anyway, 
a lot of uh, a lot of the people that were interviewed were uh, military contractors, people that had uh, ties to the American military. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, reporters were reporting what they were seeing. They were using the terms controlled demolition uh, in and around New York in live time, especially after Building 7 came down. Building 7 looked like an ordinary controlled demolition, so they knew what they were looking at. Everybody was surprised that the, the Twin Towers were converted to dust. Nobody had ever seen anything like that anywhere outside of Hiroshima. You had to be an eyewitness 30 miles away to watch build buildings get vaporized in Hiroshima because no big high rise of any kind has ever been turned to dust like those two were. Those two stand unique in the, the building of high rise buildings in all the world. And then, as I said, uh, by 9 o'clock that night, the next day, the official story was the buildings collapsed from the plane crash damage. The Roman Catholic Church has a very strong control existing mechanism for controlling their dogma. You're proposing that the media has some mechanism and to control its dogma, simply, where is it? The mechanism What's the name of it? The mechanism, the control, exist? the control of the media is done by money. Money where? and the ability to hire and Do fire. an office? No, there's no office. It's big money in motion. This is what they describe. He says, what uh, many of these authors say, what looks like a conspiracy is really nothing more than very rich, powerful people protecting their money and the ability to make more. They're moving in the same direction. But he, I, I highly recommend getting a copy of one of the censored news books and digest it. You know, I've been working with this stuff for 20 years, so it's old hat to me, but it's obviously new to you because you're, you're asking the question that these people have been saying for years. Into the buzzsaw. You try to talk about something that's taboo, you just get fired and blackball. Now, if you're in Mexico, if you step on, if a reporter steps on somebody's toes, they just send somebody out to kill you. Here, you get fired and blackballed. That's how they control. Also, they have a seven second, eight second time delay in radio how and many, film. How many reporters have been fired with the 9-11 story? Oh, a bunch. Uh, you know, the, 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 a lot of people have lost their jobs uh, in universities. University professors have been fired for investigating the science of 9-11. I mean, you wouldn't think Brigham Young would fire a physics teacher for uh, his analysis of the dust, but they did. You know, they, 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 in America, the, 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 the ability to fire somebody and prevent them from getting another living wage job, uh, that that's a huge means of control for the population in America. But look at the talking heads we have on television. Many of these people are not journalists, they're actors and actresses playing the role of journalism. Journalists, and they're making what? Half a million dollars a year, a million dollars a year. They're, they're not gonna step out of line and report something that's taboo. Like, you know, uh, that woman, Rosie O'Donnell, she was on a Today Show talking. She was talking about 9-11. They fired her. Charlie Sheen was removed from his. He had one of the most popular shows on the air, but he was using his uh, celebrity status to talk about 9-11. And they fired him, and he got the message. So, uh, you know, there's very, very strong economic control in America uh, as far as uh, controlling what's on the television with taboo subjects, all the media. It isn't just television, it's radio, newspapers. Another question? Somebody else in the audience have a question? Yes, yes. Ileana has a question. It's not a comment. No, no, it's very small. Okay. So what I try to say, thank yeah, you so much for this piece of Do you have a question? Listen, it's happened. I like capitalism, and I come from country which a lot of country copying like America. They like capitalism, so I like capitalism. So my point is, when you mention millionaires, like filthy millionaires, but you know, you know why I like capitalism in this country? Because it's land of opportunity, and everybody can be capitalist. Can you get to your question? People making I mean, $7 start, an okay, hour. Okay, fine, but they start somehow. Yeah, Those capitalists start somehow too, right? Well, yeah, if you somehow. don't have a question. I think I can answer the point she was trying to make. One of the, uh, she was trying to make a point about America being the land of opportunity. Yes. And there's a book on that. 
I like the designers. I don't know, we come from yeah, Europe, from the, to, 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 be, to have opportunities in this country. Yeah, these two books address the myth of the America being a land of opportunity. One of them is called The Betrayal of the American Dream by two of the best investigative reporters in our country, Donald L. Bartlett and James B. Steele. They, uh, they've written books over the last 25 years about what's going wrong in America, why people can't make a living with a 40-hour week job. And as I mentioned earlier, this book is brand new. Jar Jar Tyler wrote it, it's called What Went Wrong. Okay. These two describe unregulated capitalism where people no longer have the ability to get a living wage job. But okay. even capitalists, they start from somehow, right? They start from maybe... That, that's in theory. In practice, we have to deal with the billionaire predators that are killing the middle class. That's, where, that's the reality we have to deal with now. I'm sorry, I like capitalism. Move on yes. to another one? They have a lot of help. Real okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. All right. Yes. Jim. Give us your thoughts on Colonel Robert Corso from the military, who says that a lot of our age of technology happened to be come from the uh, alleged crash at uh, at the alleged crash at Roswell in 1948. Um. No fair. Did you read his book? Yes. Did it sound like he was making sense? Um, if you took a kind of an extremist viewpoint, it did say something about it. He simply said that uh, given the current deal, we couldn't have progressed technologically without some outside help. And he alleges that there was a colonel in the United States military by the name of Colonel Robert Corso, we had a whole bunch of technology from His plums. job was to feed bits and pieces to American industries, right? That's absolutely correct. Yeah, well, the, that, there's a lot of, um, you might say, published evidence that talks about that. Professor, uh, not, uh, uh, not a professor, Stephen Greer is an MD. Stephen Greer wrote this book, uh, it's called Disclosure, and the book was uh, Project Disclosure held a press conference in Washington, I think it was Washington, D.C., in the summer of 2001. Their press conference was just before 9-11 happened, and then the concept of what they were talking about just disappeared. Because what they were talking about, the Disclosure Project is made up of ex-military people from NASA, the space program. They are willing to testify under oath, in open court anywhere, about the energy technologies our government has been working with since the 50s that were based on the propulsion systems of the alien spacecraft they have recovered. They said there's a whole uh, range of energy technologies that don't use coal, oil, gas, or nukes, period. And uh, the latest out of Project Disclosure, they thought you know, a year ago, they said they thought we were a year, a year and a half, two years away from them making a global announcement saying it's time to phase the human race into using energy sources that are non-polluting, not coal, oil, gas, or nukes. And as far as I can tell, these people have very high credibility. And since they're risking their lives anyway, um, there's no way to silence them other than if one or two or three got killed, it, uh, it would just bring more publicity to the whole thing. So they're just left alone by the government and the media. All right. What are some of those emergent technologies that they've talked about, perhaps? Well, uh, I, everything I've read shows that they have um, some kind of electromagnetic propulsion systems that are able to neutralize gravity, and that's how the, the machines move. And uh, But I've never seen one up close myself. I've only read about them. But I, I probably got 20 books on that over the years. I'm familiar with the one you're talking about. That, that goes back 10, 12 years, 15 years that was published. So, Charlie? Yes. I just yeah. Uh, you can turn a building to powder. Muslims fought the Russians for quite a few years. And obviously had some organization and structure and leaders. And then they did all sorts of bombings. They blew up a ship. And they've been fighting the Israelis for a number of years. 
why do you find it so difficult to comprehend that? And they had blown up the building in New York, as a matter of fact. What makes you think they didn't have a leader like Osama bin Laden? I mean, they obviously had an organization that was conducting warfare, did all sorts of bombings elsewhere. Why should I suddenly not believe that they didn't have another bombing or you're, are you referring to 9-11? Yeah, they, you say there there can be no Osama bin Laden, he's totally fictional. No, I didn't like, say that. Well, uh, Charlie, let, let me any, finish. They didn't have any leaders? If you read that carefully, you'll see that uh, Osama bin Laden was a real person where Superman, Good. Batman, Spider-Man are all comic book movies. <coughs> the legend of Osama is based on a real person. But Osama uh, was part of a group... Uh, the Mujahideen, uh, uh, I, I never use that term. Anyway, they, um, they were helped to fight the Soviets but with American money. The CIA was heavily involved in the creation of Al-Qaeda. And uh, the, you know, there is no independent global organization named Al-Qaeda. That's Who a myth. Are we fighting? We're fighting? Well, we're fighting, uh, we're fighting uh, Incidents are created in other countries where they, they create a terrorist base. They say, oh, that's a terrorist base. We have to send in our troops to wipe them out. When in reality, that base, that area is over some you, you or resource rich. You are the existence of a Muslim terrorist organization. No, I'm not and saying... There is, to me... I'm all, saying... All these incidences are not fiction. They took place, the wars took place, the war we're fighting now is a very real war. They have organizations, structures, and leaders. So why is it not feasible that one or more of these undertook 9-11? Because they you know, they, exist. to answer your question, yes, there, there are terrorists in the world. But <clears throat> the, the, the part of the myth that's been created is that a handful of raggedy people with box cutters could do what was done on 9-11. And the forensic evidence shows that every piece of what we were told about 9-11 being done by Muslims is a myth. It didn't happen that way. And the, the hundreds of thousands of scientists all over the world are risking their lives and careers to get the word out that the, the event known as 9-11 was a major myth. It was a motivational myth. They killed 3,000 Americans. Three Americans were killed. Is that forensic evidence? The, pl uh, the planes hitting the towers had nothing to do with the destruction in New York. The, it, what, what I'm talking about is that the World Trade Center in New York was losing money. It was uh, the, uh, the coalition of buildings, collection of buildings were white elephants. They got an asbestos removal quote in 1989. It's right here in these books. The, the company that gave them the quote, an estimate said, they were told, well, thanks for the estimate, it would be $700 million, but just between us, they're going to blow up the site in 10 or 11 years and build something more profitable on it anyway. They were, they were the, the World Trade Center was a, a white elephant complex losing money, and they made the decision. They couldn't blow it up without being sued for contaminating all the other buildings in lower Manhattan with asbestos dust. That's why when the Bush administration they came along, he said, well, you need a terrorist event to motivate Congress. We need to blow up these old buildings and we can't, we don't want to be sued for asbestos, so let's call it a terrorist event. And it was the project for a new American century. That's how the idea and the whole mythology of the Muslim attack on America, the reason there was a Muslim attack was the oil-rich countries are in Muslim territory. We, if, if the oil-rich countries were in Norwegian territory, we would have been attacked by a horde of uh, rabid Swedes, right? The but we weren't. Years. We were attacked by Muslims because that's where the oil-rich territory is that the military wants to go and take over. Can I just say one? Yeah. All right. Travis. Uh, I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, there can be no denying that these ragheads uh, did in fact uh, hijack something like three planes. 
and that the three planes, two of them went through uh, uh, towers at the World Trade Center because it was seen. And one of them was forced down by the people on the plane uh, in right near the Pittsburgh area that was on its way to crashing into the White House. And another, there was a fourth one that was on its way, that, that went to and crashed into the Pentagon. Did it or did it not? Uh, the jury is still out because the film, there were like 84 security cameras, uh, all different that filmed what went into the Pentagon. No film, no piece of film has ever been released showing a big plane of any kind going into the Pentagon. The pilots, the group for pilots for 9-11 Truth, have there's several hundred pilots, Top Gun military pilots, they have debunked every single piece of what we were told about the planes flying yes, that day. <clears throat> they think that the two planes that went in the towers were two, excuse me, two large military drones that were painted to look like American and United. Um, in any case, the forensic evidence is solid about what happened in Pennsylvania. That plane wasn't taken down and flown into the ground by the heroic people on board. That was the fairy tale myth that was created and put out by the media. There are all kinds of eyewitnesses and forensic evidence showing that the plane flying over Pennsylvania was shot out of the sky. It exploded in midair and the wreckage was scattered over like eight miles. It didn't crash in a hole in the ground. You have just, you know, thank you for repeating it because you've shown us that there are people in America still that haven't had a chance to look at the evidence of what really happened. The official story is the heroic people flew the plane into the ground. All of forensic evidence shows that's a fairy tale. So it was shot down, uh, and there are eyewitnesses that reported seeing a trailing plane. Well, it was some kind of a white plane without uh, markings on it. It's like like the black helicopters, and you know, if you ever watch the SWAT team or people, they they come in black vehicles with no license plates on them. You can't tell who's coming. They don't want you to know what's going on. You okay. told me they parked it in Cleveland, took the passengers off. Well, that's, some are, you know, speculating that that's what happened. Um, I don't know myself, because I wasn't there. Uh, all I can tell you is what experts are saying is uh, there more and more information is being released each year as people are less and less afraid of getting assassinated outright for speaking out. Uh, you know, a lot of the people that are speaking on the JFK assassination are old now. They're giving deathbed confessions, so they're not uh, they're not worried about their lives being shortened by 30 years as eyewitnesses. Well, Andy, he uh, had, he had a question like, back there. Oh, last question. How much, well, uh, how much energy would it take to turn those buildings into dust? For one, and you got two planes going into the buildings. And also, what happened to the dust? After the, all of it settled, I heard it was taken to China. That's like removing the evidence. Uh, the question was, how much energy was it take to would it take to convert a plane and a building to dust compared to the plane crashes? Uh, it's in these textbooks. The amount of energy from the plane crash was estimated to be maybe one one hundredth or one five hundredth as much energy as was expended to pulverize the buildings. Each plane, each plane hitting the tower was like like throwing a, an empty aluminum beer can against a 30-foot steel telephone pole. They have no, the plane crashes had no effect on the integrity of the towers. And second, the towers did not collapse. Some of the, the only thing that fell to the ground basically was some steel girders that hadn't been pulverized and turned to dust along with all virtually all of the concrete. There was basically no rubble pile on the ground other than the 30 foot steel girders that had been cut by the cutting charges to uh, make them easy to pick up for the salvage equipment. So that, you know the same, uh, same company that uh, cleaned up Oklahoma City was the company that they gave the contract to to clean up and, and they did squirrel away. A lot of the evidence was shipped off to China as fast as they could. As fast. That's the evidence of what happened. And they, all of, you know, no, no crime scene investigators right. were permitted at any of the sites on 9-11. Okay? Well, right. Again, that's about it. Nobody else has a question. Nobody has okay. remarks to make to the rest of us. Let's thank Andy again. Yeah. Uh, one, one final thing, uh, if any of you have 
you know, uh, when we drive home after, you know, uh, we forget, we say, well, I should have asked that question or something. If, uh, if you need a piece of paper, if you want to hand in a question that I could, uh, you know, get references for and bring it back next week or the week after, I'd be more than happy to help any of you with references. Just write down something specific and give it to me, and I'll, I'll write back, you know, the, uh, the books, articles, uh, the sources, whatever, because there's a mountain of evidence on all of these things when, we talked about. When tonight. are you going to publish all this on the web and get a website? What am I? Uh, I don't see myself putting up a website anytime real soon, but maybe next year. We'll see. Okay. All right. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, the weather has been flooded. Gave her a little uh, snow. Scourge. Okay. Let's get the rebuttals going. Yeah. Probably five to seven minutes. Seven to five, yeah. six. Go about six minutes. Six minutes, yes. All right. Uh, we'll start with Neil Red. Thank you. I, uh, perhaps I was mistaken. I was expecting some current events, not stuff 10 and 50 years old. Um, There really are such things as conspiracies, but it, it's not necessarily easy to tell. You're outside on a bright summer day and all of a sudden it starts raining and everybody runs inside. Well, if you had a, like a silent movie, it certainly would look coordinated, but it's not. Everybody simply has the same interest and they're, they're acting on it independently, but everybody runs inside the same way at the same time. Um, that's not a conspiracy. And um, rich people acting in their personal interest is not necessarily a conspiracy. They're, they certainly can be, but it, the, the superficial appearance of, co of, of cooperation is not evidence. Um, there are real conspiracies. Propaganda due in Italy, um, and which, which still has, owns part of the Italian government. Berlusconi was a member. Um, the murder of Roberto Calvi in London is, is like an Alan Moore comic book and is kind of interesting. It used the phrase that JFK uh, could have had a heart attack. And by golly, uh, the, the brand new pope, been pope for a month, said, you know, I've got to audit the books of the bank that there has been having all this trouble. And the next morning he woke up dead. Um, that's, I, I, some people think it was murder. I, I, take neither side. But right here at home, uh, the reporter Gary Webb, who published an enormous amount of detail about the Iran-Contra uh, uh, cocaine and arms smuggling ring, uh, was utterly blackballed, defamed by all of the, the big uh, institutions in journalism, and driven to suicide. So, yes, conspiracy is sometimes real. However, uh, 2,200 years ago, in the city of Alexandria, Eratosthenes accurately calculated the circumference of the Earth. Uh, it's not clear whether he also calculated the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Perhaps he got that too. But his, his calculation of the circumference of the Earth was within a couple of percent of our current figure. He got it right. Uh, whatever, 1,700 years later, when Columbus read Eratosthenes, Columbus disagreed and uh, had a, came, wanted to believe in a smaller number. Columbus was wrong. Uh, so much for the flat Earth. Uh, I don't think there's anybody here who doesn't know that we've got problems with the environment. Um, I, I, it's hard to remember normal weather anymore. Um, <coughs> The basic problem at Fukushima is that it was a syndicate contractor that built the thing. Uh, the, the Yakuza, uh, just like at home here, are into heavy construction, lots of room to skim money, and they're also into the government. Uh, so you, you don't have to go much further than just the fact that it's, it's all syndicate to account for um, just 
you know, totally pretending that, that things are okay and, and so on and so forth. And incidentally, it's not radioactive water. The water's not radioactive. It's water carrying a variety of, of trace contaminants which are radioactive, although some of them, relatively trace amounts, can be very, very serious. And uh, I, I haven't chased it down. I don't have, have real solid information, but I have seen things that were absolutely insane, like on one day a thousand people in, in the, on our west coast were killed by this stuff. No. Um, let's see, fracking. Um, fracking is primarily about a trillion dollars worth of oil and gas. Uh, the fact that it destroys the land uh, is, who cares? You know, they'll just move on. The cash is portable. Uh, we, we've got entire counties in Appalachia that have been turned into trash uh, with mountaintop removal. Uh, they, why should the, the, the people extracting the money care? Um, yeah, they use some toxic chemicals, but it's a, it's a trade secret what they're really using. Um, and the reason they need those complex compounds has to get into it, the whole, the whole geochemistry of, of cracking. Um, Chelsea Manning is probably the only current item. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Chelsea spent the entire year in solitary confinement, so there's not a lot of direct news. Uh, I, I am curious which article of the UCMJ you were talking about. I don't recall the expression crimes against humanity being in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, offshore profits, um, right now the European Union is working on changing their basic regulations to straighten that mess out, or at least make it, make it a little less egregious. Um, which, which makes it difficult to consider it a, a, a very suppressed uh, story. Um, yeah, the media is basically six um, monster corporations. And uh, sociopathic tendencies is a little bit fuzzy, but 4% um, if you've ridden the L lately, it's, you, you have no trouble believing that one person out of 25 just sees you as an inconvenient meat puppet. Uh, that's a, an optimistic estimate, if, if, if anything. And uh, there has been uh, some work in the last several years that's pointed out that by law, a corporation is required to be sociopathic. A, a corporation must make as much money as possible and is not allowed to consider any other consequences such as fouling their nest or destroying their, the community they're in. Um, I just got waved uh, but I, I hit my time. Iceland did, find, did just put a banker in jail and um, you don't know what you're talking about about HIV. He's a true believer and uh, I admire that for you, but uh, AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Immune deficiency is a defining word. That means your immune system is diminished. For City Force announcement in 1984, Call for is that, that if you reach a, your T cell level, that is the immune cell that is uh, connected with HIV virus, uh, I mean fighting it, if they diminish to a certain level of 500 or so, yeah. then person chances of getting infection and serious consequences are greater. Due to advance in medicines, now, CD4 has reduced the T cell level to something like 200, 250 because we can control infection better and we have a T cell, uh, we have a medicine that controls uh, our immune system, whatever it is, helps uh, our immune system. So, I think the problem is here is that 
that age is not a disease. It is a condition. It's a condition of a just a diabetes. Diabetes, you have a, you are supposed to be around 100, and if you go to 500, you get up in the morning or 500 sugar. It's a doctor, I have 500 sugar. Okay, you are in danger of dying. You are in a serious situation. And, and now if you, are, if you are saying within, let's say, 100, doctor said, we got to get, get it down, get it down. And they get it down to 180, 170, okay. And doctor says, well, okay, it's still bad, but it's not dangerous. It's not going to that die. Okay, well, 500, 600, you die of soft. The, the acquiring age is like that, okay? Before, we did not have a medicine, and if you get reached below 500, per person, pneumococcus, pneumonia, I mean, people were dying of that, and I know that, because my friends have died of that, okay? But for you to say that HIV doesn't cause age, what do you mean that? It has no meaning at all. You don't know. I mean, he's right. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, no matter what, what, any, what, what, anybody, what anybody says, you know. I mean, he's a black guy, he's black, because, you know, he looks black, he's black, okay? okay what, what does it mean? It doesn't mean nothing, okay? Okay, maybe, maybe God cursed him, that's why he's black, okay? Or maybe he came from a tropical country, that's why he's black, okay? It makes no difference, okay? That, I mean, the, I mean, you've been carrying on this thing for years, and, and it's the most, most problem putting about me. Because go and read it. I, I, I spent three hours, day before yesterday, going on a Cairns Academy and a full article explaining every stages of age. From your B cell, antibody, T cells, T4 cell, T8 cells, phagocytes, and uh, and then uh, what happens to a cells which are not into their ce the cellular cellular uh, problem? Okay, where cell is nothing but uh, some t t uh, some age where uh, HIV virus gets inside it, and then T T cell uh, the cell has to destroy. It screams that something wrong. Okay. And, and, and that is true. Now conspiracy, everything is there, okay, I understand, okay. I don't, I don't care, I don't care. For me, 9-11 is over. You know, stupidity was that, that we went to war, okay, without knowing what in the hell we were getting into. And what, and we had no reason to go, okay. We saw a gun to gun and more intelligently. We, we did not use our intelligence, we used our, uh, our, our bravado, our macho, and not our intelligence. First, first World War in Kuwait, the same bullshit was there. We should have prevented Kuwait, okay? If, if a Bush would have said that, look, you stay, we cross the line up, uh, I'll beat the shit out of you. You know, I'll throw, it, I'll throw a nuclear bomb on you, okay? And Saddam would have backed off. We did not, he did not, do, he said, we have no interest in it. We do not have no trade with Kuwait. And that's why, what I'm saying is that mistakes are strategic. And we have a strategic mistakes in this country. I was listening to a Chinese, Chinese venture capitalist the other day. He said, do you know something? You guys don't go by evidence. You wrong. That, you lost that art. Okay? Talking about evidence, last 30 years, world poverty reduced by about, about less than little, about 1 billion people. Poor people went from poor to middle class. Okay? And he said, what? You know what happened? 650 million out of that, they were in China, and they said, look, China was a communist country, and we did it, okay? And, and, and do you know something? All the democracy put together, they did not do it. America, he says, you want me to have, you follow your, your democratic system? Okay. You put more people in a, from middle class to poverty, okay, over the last 30 years, and then you want me to follow that system? I, I'm not going to. What I'm saying is that we have scientific evidence, we have measurements, we know what we are doing, we are not that stupid, okay? That is a chemistry, okay? Sci scientists who, who give medication and people live longer life with HIV, the, the, what, is, what is that football player? For, 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 Magic Johnson, okay? He lived so many years and he knows, he knows his doctor made him live, his medication live, make him live that longer, he would not have. I have a, I have a every week, I was in a, I was in, I was, I had a student at Diversity and a Clark. 
You know, you know my, my customers were gay. Almost 70%, 70 percent, seventy percent, five hundred customers were gay. We used to, and I, I had a charge account with customers. Every every week we used to get a letter. Somebody died. You know, somebody. And every day we hear somebody died or somebody got pneumonia or somebody that thing. It's not funny, okay? And it's real. And I know how much progress we have made, okay? Now, if you believe in something that it is not there, so many progress, so many medicine, whatever you can do, but you cannot do that. Then you know it's no bullshit. Somebody says something, something, something. I don't care. It doesn't mean no difference. Okay? Bob said that Joe and Jill, Joe and Jill had a sex in the office last night. Hey, what do I give a damn? It doesn't mean a darn thing. Okay? You you give me the proof. You give me medi You give me theory. You give me a solution. You give me medicine and cure. And that's all. <laughs> Having sex in I'm Michael Foley. First, I want to say thank you to Andy for the presentation. And I want to say that I believe most of what Andy says. I agree with most of what Andy says, and I'm sure that I really think he's right about most of what he says. Anyway, here's another lie. Our government tells us this all the time. We're the world's only superpower. The reason that's a lie is because we're not a superpower at all. And it was proved again in the last couple of weeks. I love it when these stupid politicians start yelling and screaming about how tough we are, and we're superpowers, and we'll go fight anybody and all that BS. Anyway, a couple of weeks ago, China announced that there were two islands near China and near Japan. And the president of China announced that these islands were Chinese territory and nobody could fly an airplane over these islands without the permission of China. Now the Chinese guy's name, I'm not even sure what it is, that's why I ain't saying his name. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the guy, but I can't pronounce his name. It's something like Xi Jinping or something like that. But anyway, President Obama got all bent out of shape. Who's this Chinese Connie guy to tell us we can't fly our planes here? So he called up the president of China, started yelling and screaming, calling him a dirty, stinking, pinko godless Chinese Connie guy. And he said, we'll show you, you little Chinese guy, we're going to fly some B-52s over this island, and you ain't going to do nothing about it. So anyway, this was all widely reported in the media, and in fact, the United States did fly two B-52s from Guam to where these islands are near China and near Japan, flew them around these islands for a while and then flew them back to Guam. And this was all widely reported in the media, and President Obama looked like this super bad, tough guy, super power, rah, rah! It was all widely reported in the media. But there was something that wasn't reported in the media. That was when President Obama was talking to the Chinese guy. After he got yelling, done yelling and screaming about we're going to fly our planes around and everything, he said to the Chinese president, hey man, can you lend us some gas money? We got to borrow money from you. We're flat broke. And we got to borrow from money from you so we can buy jet fuel for the airplanes. We got these airplanes in Guam, we got flight crews in Guam, we got atom bombs and planes and missiles all over the world. But we ain't got the money for the planes to fill them up with gas so we can fly the planes to over your crummy islands in China. And that's what happened. China had to lend the United States government money so the United States government could fly a couple of planes around to show the whole world how rough and tough and how bad we were, standing up to the Chinese guys. We're living on borrowed money, we're living on printed money, we are not a superpower, we can't send a soldier anywhere in the world to kill anybody unless we borrow money for jet fuel, for the airplane, to send the guy over to the country, and then we gotta borrow money to buy some bullets so the soldier can shoot some bullets and kill somebody. We ain't much of a superpower or nothing. Now, 
the thing about the war against the middle class, Andy talks about, said the, there's a war going on in this country, and the war is against the middle class. And he's right about that. It's got to do with this whole same thing about borrowing money. Actually, the war against the middle class is almost over. The main mission of the war against the middle class has already been accomplished. The middle class in the United States of America no longer exists. The middle class in the, what used to be the middle class in the United States is now the destitute class. The middle class in the United States of America owes 17 trillion dollars. That's approximately $56,000 for every person living in this country. There's no way the middle class can pay $17 trillion. They owe this money. They are destitute. The upper class in this country hasn't got hip to this yet. They don't care about it. They're making their millions of dollars a year. They're not interested in this. They figure, ah, who cares? Well, who cares should be them because when the middle class can't pay the 17 trillion, most of it's going to fall on them. They're going to owe the 17 trillion, and they can't pay it either. I think what's going to happen is there's a lot of countries in this world that have lended us money. They're going to stop lending us money, and we're living on that money. We're also living on money that the Federal Reserve Bank is just creating with computers. It's just like printing money only instead of printing it they just say hey to the government here's 85 million dollars a month in your bank account when countries stop lending us money they're going to say pay us the money you owe the government is going to have to start either literally printing money like hundred million dollar bills and start paying them off to billions or they're going to do it electronically the Federal Reserve says, say, okay, you got $20 billion in loans, well, just put, just put down $20 billion in your account. The only place they're going to be able to spend this money is in the United States. That sounds great. We owe $17 trillion, and we'll just tell people we owe, just take $17 trillion, buy anything you want in this country. It's going to cause ruinous inflation. That's where we're headed. In this country right now we're involved, we have serious inflation. We are headed for absolutely ruinous inflation. Okay, I'm done. But that's it. We are no longer a super borrow power. We gotta buy the money, borrow the money to buy bullets and jet fuel. And we are so flat broke that there really isn't a middle class anymore. Thank you. China holds 8% of U.S. debt. Well, there's still 92% we got to pay off, you been. dummy. Yeah. It has well, if been. we don't borrow it from China, we'll yeah. borrow it from somebody else, oh, you big dumb dummy. Dummy, yeah. <laughs> You're a dummy. 8% minus 100%. There's no personal it's 92%. tax. Totally. No personal Whoa. tax. <laughs> it's not an attack, it's a fact. Oh, He's a big mouth dummy. It's a fact. It's not an attack. <laughs> That's one of the rules. <laughs> Santa's going to bring a hole in your stock. Hey, if I don't care, it why should you? It has been said that the collapse of Rome has a hundred different theories to it. Yeah. Probably. As a matter of fact, in the last ages of the collapse of the Roman Empire, a traveler by the name of Dirichitu traveled by sea rather than the Roman roads because the infrastructure was crumbling. Yet at the same time, the Romans were aware of the steam engine through a little uh, getting very close to it. But I believe their empire collapsed because of a lack of energy and a lack of initiative and a general wooden-headedness escalating from their politicians trying to keep and elicit the status quo running. 
I don't believe a lot of what Andy says, but I do agree with the wooden-headedness of some of America's politicians and major corporations that we're going to be in a road of trouble. Whether you believe in climate change or not, you do know that we are running out of oil. You do know that we are polluting the atmosphere. You do know that we are generally running an unsustainable fossil fuel-based economy. And that I personally believe renewables aren't simply going to cut it. Despite what we have seen, that rapid advances in solar power, in the wind power, in the smart grid technology, and many other areas of, the, of, of initiative, I still do not believe that we're going to be able to power today's society without either, number one, a drastic population reduction so that we can keep those alive living this 21st century lifestyle or having some form of power that will make this society run. Since the late 70s, I have been looking for that kind of power. I still firmly believe that that power is going to be the nuclear genie that we've had for many years. Not the light water reactors that I firmly agree with Andy with are insane, unsustainable, and unworkable. But I also know too that Andy may be familiar with the with work that was done at Oak Ridge in the 1960s on something called the the liquid fluoride reactor, which uses liquids, which runs at atmospheric pressure, and which is a lot, which has the capability of burning up a lot of our present-day nuclear wastes. It's not the panacea because there still is radiation. There still is a small risk of proliferation. But I firmly believe that we need to, if we're really going to get innovative and really solve society's problems, it's going to involve the power of thorium with all of its benefits because there's more thorium in the world than any other trace element and used properly in the form of a oh. liquid fluoride thorium reactor we have the potential to have a power plant the size of this restaurant power the whole north side of the city of Chicago and having maybe one, gig, one ton per gigawatt of waste product at the end of the cycle, which basically sequestered for 400 years in a, in a field or some kind of thing, will make it relatively hazardous, considering the fact that that will displace all the oil, all the carbon brought out by coal and, by coal and other forms of fossil fuels, that that might be the way to go forward. What you don't hear about today is that the Chinese have already gone down to Oak Ridge. They've looked at the various reactor designs and they now have 300 people looking into this, ver into this very thing. And I honestly think that America used to build things. We used to be a, a capitalistic nation, but now we've ate our seed corn and basically sold away through the monetization of patents and certain theories out of the city, out of this Chicago school, have basically turned from capitalist to mercantilist. I honestly believe that if we're going to move forward and keep our society benefiting those, we need to get a really good hardcore energy source that will power this world. Right now, most of your electricity is ran. About 2% of the world's electricity runs what they call data centers. And going green is not necessarily going green. Did you realize that watching an 8 second cat video on YouTube is the equivalent of driving a car 100 feet? On gas? There's a lot that can be done to solve society's ills. I don't want to get more into it now because my time is running short. But the wealth gap was addressed by Teddy Roosevelt, the antitrust buster, and by some far-reaching capitalists in the early 
in the early part of the last century. We should relearn those lessons. Thank you. done so much research on uh, and spoken on so often uh, over the years. He has a lot of patience and I'm sorry that uh, more people were not able to get here given the season and uh, the weather. But uh, I also understand that people are discouraged uh, with uh, the uh, nebulousness of uh, controlling conspiracies and uh, 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 vague uh, ideas of who might be responsible for the death of uh, uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Uh, the whole point of seeing uh, some billionaires as uh, conspirators does not make anything tangible that one can put one's finger to or speak of as uh, something that, that one can uh, have something to do with. Uh, therefore, what should I do? That is, of course, uh, and given the, the basis of a conspiracy, the, hidden and secretive thing and covered up and well yes there are conspiracies every corporation is a conspiracy because they've all got secrets there are trade secrets every family has its secrets every person has their secrets and uh, sometimes uh, we work in common uh, with other people having the same interests without even conspiring. We can see that our advantages are the same or the, uh, our disadvantages are the same and that something that we can do about it uh, uh, will work. And so we conspire to vote one way or another or back uh, of, of, of a purchase rather than uh, oppose it. Uh, when it comes to to fighting nebulous conspiracies, it's a, a difficult sort of business. And unless uh, you can supply greater facts, uh, it gets a little discouraging even if you have a belief that there is such a conspiracy. And if you're not convinced that there is the conspiracy, you uh, are not going to act against it. Uh, certainly you uh, are, are left a little high and dry. Uh, it's something that here we hear about uh, as a conjecture. Uh, Though books are written about the conjecture, or conjectures, 
I mean, uh, were the trade towers uh, uh, destroyed by uh, free energy, or were they destroyed by uh, planting uh, all sorts of uh, dustifying explosives all over uh, those? We haven't. I haven't heard here uh, a definite statement of which. Uh, uh, method of destruction was followed, only that uh, the reduction to dust of the uh, buildings uh, did not, was not uh, probable uh, from the uh, uh, fuel of the uh, uh, of the planes. Uh, well, I'm not even sure of that. But then I'm not uh, a physio, uh, a physical therapist, oh, yeah. <laughs> a physicist, or and, and uh, no, no. Universal uh, a physical statement has uh, been uh, delivered on that subject, much less uh, a statement on who killed Kennedy. Okay, Charlie. All right, this is St. Brown. All right, you guys are putting me to sleep here. <laughs> I don't see here anyhow. Let's thank Andy again. Putting together things we all look very good here. All right, I'm going to be eclectic as usual. Let's all thank Brock for the yeah, job that he's yeah, done. By the way, I might be bringing some uh, College of Complexes t shirts next week, so we'll have a little free raffle as Christmas presents as a little incentive to you guys. First of all, um, Covered a number of things, but uh, I represented employees in the building trades, and I didn't know this was part of the conspiracy theory with 9/11 that the building was demolished to preclude some sort of asbestos claims. I was directly involved in dealing with asbestos issues with mechanical maintenance engineers. It's an abatement and encapsulation. Uh, I was thinking about this. Now, the one thing about friable asbestos is it, it's a very nefarious substance, meaning once it gets airborne, it doesn't settle. It could remain airborne for a week or more. This is one of, one of the hazardous aspects of it. And very little of it can, be, can cause you harm. Now, I must say to, and asbestos is found in, I mean, I represent employees in 6,800 federal buildings, many of which were built uh, around the turn of the century, old courthouses and things. I, we never considered, the, you know, demolishing them in that fashion to avoid claims. I. Uh, I really have a hard time, even given the age, I don't know the age of the Twin Towers, that they actually wouldn't use asbestos in it. Now the other thing though, that I've got to question your explanation here is, is that they came up with this whole process, and you're actually saying that they planned, this is the simplified thing they wanted to do, Simplification now was to set loose friable asbestos across Manhattan Island. <laughs> and this is a simplified solution they came up with instead of, you can encapsulate it. It's fine, it meets the criteria of uh, permissible, but to let loose this is quantity 
of Freiburg's, but you would kill everyone in Manhattan. In Queens and Brooklyn too. I, it just is not realistic that anybody in their right mind would undertake this to avoid some sort of litigation when the solution there is apparent. But anyway, I'll leave that at that. The other thing I'd like to talk about, you've used the term censorship. Censorship was a strong term. Now, there are places where we study censorship as librarians, and we don't like it. But it usually means there's an exercise of authority. And somebody says, you're not going to do this or that, otherwise you're going to get that. You give me some kind of stuff, yada, 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 well, you get fired or something like that. That's not censorship. There's 55,000 books published in the United States. There are numerous publications, more numerous. You, you look at any of the media directories, they're just enormous volumes. The amount of printed material. It's the printing press is still humming away. There's a printer here. I just came across a printing press was like it was considered the number two invention of mankind. They're cranking out stuff every day of the week. The way it works is, in the media, you have certain mainline publications like the New York Times, especially the media, that sign it. When they get stories, then they're kind of, they're, there is a control to it, that they look toward these mainline publications. That's why I subscribe to that. Because if you get then then you get off to the periphery, and you got to be careful. It's not censorship that's the issue. It's gibberish and nonsense. And now you got this internet, when any Jamo can put out stuff, whatever they want, and nobody says a lot of hooey. They don't really care. The guy running the internet service, as long as he gets his money, I could go home and I could put up a web page after the college complex is of absolute nonsense. And no one will control me. No one will say, take it down. I, I no, no evidence of that ever happening. I'm not aware of it. Do you know of any website that was told? I. Rare. I uh, the, the most recent example I have was something called a Texan with a triple X. That was because they were uh, there was issues involved with uh, photographs of, of women that were in various body poses that were All right, taken we're talking down. about pornography and child pornography, but no, that's where the, and then countries where censorship is really active. You have to have an agent and an apparatus that enforces it. And uh, suppositions of dark, nefarious schemes doesn't quite cut it. We need a little evidence here. Now, the other thing you're hitting on here, I'm going to pick on you in here. You say, oh, so no one has any doubt, you can't doubt it. Now, you gave the example of dogma. And the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church had reasons to believe, and I believe they truly did believe this that according to the scriptures, God had created the universe in a certain fashion. They were not just gibberish on this. And they also had the Protestant church was out there preaching just the opposite. And the other religions, world religions, didn't describe it all. So there was no censorship. And they tried to enforce censorship. But when you are trying to promote your own perspectives a little bit like this dogma. There can be no doubt. And I've got to wonder if there's no topic on earth, on earth in which there cannot be doubt. We haven't come across that fact yet. And they, in very fact, can be doubted and challenged. But that's not a good example, even of censorship, because they are, their censorship extended no further than their own church authorities. And they had a very good apparatus for enforcing the rules of that. Um, and last of all, all this thing, even about censorship and get ready right, to keep beeping from the truth, I don't think it ends up serving any purpose whatsoever because we got people like in the back of the room, despite all we've talked here about <laughs> capitalism <laughs> being exploited <laughs> and how people are, can't live and making a few bucks per hour and they're starving. They still get up there and say, oh, capitalism is real cool. It is. And it's really great. And I don't think, you know, the censorship, this, this, no, information doesn't work. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks a lot. You get the last word, Andy. Capitalism. <laughs> Andy. Yes. 
Um, I'll be brief here, just answer a couple points that um, Neil said uh, he was uh, expecting to see more current events uh, rather than things that are 50 years old. Well, the reason it matters uh, who killed Kennedy was that our government was taken over and moved in a different direction by people that weren't elected. It was a coup that started in 63 and moved on with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 and picked up speed with Bill Clinton in 1992. <coughs> Uh, and then it, it hit like uh, 80 miles an hour with the installation of George Bush in the year 2000. History matters. If, if we don't learn, any from it, learn anything from it, then um, we're doomed to repeat the mistakes. Uh, a lot of people have commented on that. I don't know who is the original quote. <clears throat> but at any rate, the problem with fracking, the problem with the wall of war in the middle class, the problem with Fukushima, which is a disaster of biblical proportions, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the new yes, rules they're disaster. trying to put in that will eliminate uh, the ability of people to stop the pollution and destruction of their communities by corporations in the, in the pursuit of unbridled profits. Uh, Obama's war on whistleblowers, uh, the ongoing war on whistleblowers in the government, these things are all very current and they are part and parcel of the drift of the United States into something that isn't the land of the free and the home of the brave. I want to ma uh, make another simple observation. When people tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not standing up here giving you an opinion. Let me give you a quote. <laughs> There's a difference between an opinion from Rush Limbaugh that has no basis in reality and a summary of the collective thinking and research of thousands of scientists. This is how we move forward learning things. That's how we know that breathing asbestos dust is a health hazard rather than allowing the companies to go on saying, oh, you don't need a mask, uh, that's, it's okay to breathe that. Uh, all major medical and scientific progress has been made with people doing research, other people checking their research. This stack of books here represents the work of probably 10, 20,000 scientists and researchers with the references all over the world who have been documenting for 25 years that there are no published articles showing how the mechanism, how the, the, the so-called HIV virus causes illness. Has there been an article about this in the New England Journal of Medicine? Yeah. Um, he asked the New England Journal of Medicine. I just gave Charlie a book that is called AIDS, uh, Virus or Drug Induced. It's a story, of, uh, it's a collection of peer-reviewed journal articles that shows you the scientific thinking of the biomedical researchers that have been publishing this stuff for 25 years. The idea that HIV is not the cause of what's making people sick, and the idea that a lot of people died because they were taking a fatal poison that they thought was an antiviral drug, those two ideas are proven by a massive amount of data. And um, where is it? But the, it, this, this book is called Silencing Scientists and Other Scholars in Other Fields paradigm control, peer review. It describes how in the United States the peer review process today is being used to exclude um, research on a variety of things that questions mainstream doctrine. We don't have an open 
viable scientific community in the United States anymore like we did 50 years ago. But this one was the first one I've seen, you know, the, the scholars that wrote this one, they said, if Duesberg is right, and we think that he is, then his book, Inventing the AIDS Virus, should go down in history as one of the all-time great whistleblowing books where the author got the evidence right, all of it, years before anybody else was willing to come forward and begin to look at the, the data. So all, I'm, all I can say on those of you that tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm summarizing an enormous database for you. And for you to continue to tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, when lives are being ruined in this country today with the bogus, totally faulty HIV test, I think that's, you know, it's obstruction of justice. Uh, you're, you're involved in obstructing the spread of knowledge that could help young people avoid getting falsely classified HIV positive and falsely sucked into the billion dollar, multi-billion dollar a year AIDS industry that wants to prescribe worthless drugs to people that aren't even sick in the first place. It's, it's the last comment I have, you know. It, well, this is 15 years old. Yeah, that was written 15 years ago, and that's the tip of the iceberg. That's, see, people have been writing this stuff for 15, 20 years. You log on to the site called uh, the Alberta Reappraising Aid Society and, and Virus Myth. There's a site called virusmyth.com. The reason that I, I brought these books in here to show you that book is written back from the 90s. This book, AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire, is an up-to-date summary. This was published in 2010. This is not an old book. And there are others coming out. You can log on to the Alberta Reappraising Aid Society uh, and log on to that site and you, you can download videos. You can for 17 bucks, you can buy a video, load it onto your uh, computer. It's called Positively False, The Birth of a Heresy. And it, it interviewed, they interviewed a whole bunch of scientists and tell the whole official story of how the hoax of the AIDS, infectious AIDS epidemic got started. There, there's all kinds of videos and books uh, describing it as the crime of the century, the hoax of the century. The, the idea that HIV causes AIDS is considered the largest, costliest, most embarrassing medical mistake in human history. I am not saying that a lot of people didn't die from all kinds of illnesses. I, you know, it was hard for me to face the reality that a friend I had died, didn't die of AIDS, that she, she was poisoned by the pharmaceutical industry. I thought that several years ago before the new video came out talking about Ryan White, the hemophiliac boy from Indiana that died. We were told Ryan White died of AIDS. Well, the new video says what you need to know about Ryan White's history. He was a hemophiliac. He didn't have AIDS and he didn't die of AIDS. He was murdered by the AIDS establishment by a doctor that was paid to write prescriptions for AZT. The doctors made a lot of money writing prescriptions and keeping people on their medicine when they knew that that was a fatal chemotherapy drug. They knew they were poisoning their patients. You can't go through medical school and get a medical degree without having a rudimentary understanding of that you're looking at side effects from a toxic poison of some kind. I, and I, I understand how hard it is for old people people over 50 that had lived in the AIDS time and had people die. I was one of them. I had a friend that died of AIDS. And I, I, I believe that she died of AIDS, uh, you know, like a whole bunch of others until I stumbled onto some of these books. Uh, the first one of this whole series. This is not the New England Journal of Medicine. No, it's not. This is stuff that has not been published anywhere in a valid journal of medicine. There are more journals. It says it in here. The New England Journal of Medicine is not the only journal that stuff gets published in for scientists 
refereed journal is what you want. What? You want the term refereed journal. There's um, what I can tell you about uh, publications, since you guys have uh, so much trouble understanding that there's a large, very large number of scientists and researchers that have been publishing what you know you call the contrary view. That's been published uh, for 25 years. The scientific group, the reappraisal of AIDS, has some highly credible people in it, hundreds of them, in fact, and that group was formed in 1992. The office, the office OMSJ it is, Office of Scientific and Medical Justice, they go into court and they uh, prove when people are uh, accused of exposing somebody to the fatal virus, they prove two things in court and get the case dismissed. Number one, the HIV test don't test for the virus in the first place. So there's no way to know if that person was HIV positive or not. Number two, they prove that there are no scientific papers anywhere that have been published to this date that show the mechanism that HIV causes any kind of illness. While there is a massive amount of data showing that other things were making people sick in the AIDS epidemic, a whole bunch of other things were diagnosed as AIDS to make it look like we had this infectious epidemic. But if you'll notice, you look back in history, the CDC and the NIH never took any measures in the United States to stop something that was infectious. The CDC knew in 1983 that the AIDS epidemic was not infectious. And uh, the, the insiders knew that from day one, but that's not the official story that got out to the American public. We've been living with uh, an unofficial story that has no basis in reality. Other countries are moving forward. Other countries are telling people, don't get an HIV test for any reason and don't take the AIDS medicines because they aren't going to help you either. Get, find out that's what illness you... It's dangerous to say that. Well, that's, that's the official story that's and being that's promoted. Okay. Yeah, people don't and and, they, and they, what? They, they can count the HIV virus in a blood, okay? Uh, and, and they can can I, hold that. Time out, time out. Before you interrupt me, have you read any of these books here? I don't have one of that. Well, I, you're, you're expressing an opinion without no, having not, looked at the database at all. What you're is bullshit. Uh, what you are saying uh, is contrafactual. Nice Thank you for coming tonight. Your books have nothing to do you're, with it. You make your my emotional point. commitment you, to a contrarianism is deal. the center. I don't have an emotional commitment to this. I mean, I mean, that it doesn't, doesn't make any difference to me. I just I translate databases as a hobby. Is, Name and that's one what conspiracy yeah. theory that you think is garbage. Oh. Yeah. We're not, I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I'm not talking about, about conspiracy theories. Name one conspiracy. I'm You're talking, talking about, about the AIDS conspiracy. You're talking about the 9-11 conspiracy. Well, 9 You're talking about the Kennedy conspiracy. Name one conspiracy theory that you think is garbage. Okay. Neil just asked you one conspiracy theory I think is garbage. The idea, the, the idea that two planes flew into towers and the kerosene melted the buildings and whoop, everything disintegrated. That's a conspiracy theory that's garbage. And you should know that, Neil. But it's easy to tell somebody that they don't know what they're talking about if you haven't read any of the data. And you, you, you it's are... It's easy when they don't know what they're talking about. Well, you are a classic example of what I talked about tonight. <laughs> Neil just showed us what conceptual conservatism is like. You continue believing something long after the facts have proven your belief false. You may That's be the first saying. person in my 66 years to call me a conservative. <laughs> <laughs> it's, con it's conceptual conservatism. Look it up. And if, if you want you want to debate me on any of these things, bring your evidence. Well, no, no, but I made you a presentation. Thank you, and <laughs> Especially our speakers, we'll hear it for our speakers.